being via video conference and our witnesses will be briefing us via video conference this morning. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. So just to remind members to mute their tablet devices by pushing F4. Um, so first item on the agenda is apologies and I don't think we have any. I think everybody's No, uh, apart from Stuart, but I haven't had an apology, so I'm assuming they're here. Chair. Um, item number two then is the draft minutes, um, which are at page five of your pack um, from the meeting on the 11th, no, the 18th of um, That should November. be the 18th. I don't know why that still says four. <laughs> it's tricked me. Um, are members content that they're an accurate reflection of the meeting? Great. Thank, Thank you. you. So we're going to move straight on to item number four and come back to, to chair's business afterwards. Um, our briefing this morning is from the EU Exit Preparation and Transition Group um, about business readiness for the end of the transition period. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page 134 of your pack. Um, there is a list of initial questions regarding common frameworks at page 137 of your pack. Um, and we um, had a, a briefing yesterday um, through the Chairperson's Liaison Group from the EU Affairs Manager about common frameworks. Um, so there are those questions that are there in terms of the initial questions we can put to officials and um, then if there's anything that we need to follow up on we can do that with the department. Um, at page 139 of your pack, Annex A is an update on business preparedness. Um, page 144 of your pack, Annex B is BFE's business readiness action plan. Um, and there is correspondence from the Minister on the current EU Structural and Investment Funds at page 148. Members had asked for that breakdown. Um, and uh, last week after our meeting with NICVA, it's anticipated that the British Government has confirmed that details of the Shared Prosperity Fund will be announced following the spending review today, so we'll all wait with a of breath for that. Um, the British Government has said it intends to use the financial assistance powers in the UK Internal Market Bill to implement the fund, and obviously um, concerns have been expressed around that. Um, uh, just on the, sorry to interrupt you, okay. just on the, the letter that the Minister sent to the committee, I serve on this committee, but I also serve on the committee for the Executive Office, and I think there, there's obviously EU Affairs and SEUPB and stuff like that. There's obviously a bit of a a crossover between the two. Would it be worth forwarding that letter that the minister sent to uh, Colin McGrath, chair of the executive yeah. office, Absolutely. just so he can see that as well? Yep. We'll do, do that. that. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Um, so then, 4.5. This correspondence from the minister on EU exit legislation at page 150 of your pack. The minister has indicated that there are four SRs that are not expected to be completed by the end of the transition period as the limited time available to complete and secure legal clearance to draft and progress the necessary assembly processes prior to the end of December will not be possible. In one case, the absence of sufficient information on the protocol means that the Department is not in a position to develop draft legislation at this time. More information on these specific statutory rules is set out at Annex C of the Minister's letter at page um, 157 of your pack. There is a clerk's memo regarding the previous DFE EU exit briefing from the 30th of September at page 163 of your pack, and this provides detail around the internal market bill. So, this briefing with the officials will allow for the committee to hear um, their views on around business readiness for the end of the transition period and to get any further updates that are available. Um, so, I'd like to welcome to the meeting this morning, and if we could bring into the spotlight, please. Um, Shane Murphy, Victor Dickelow, Julia Niho Kinchi, and Mary McIver from um, all of the e EU Exit Preparation and Transition Group. So, if I pass over to yourselves, <coughs> oh, not in spotlight yet. Oh, there they come. Oh. To do them one at a time. Uh, sir, can you, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Shane. Where are you? Uh, uh, apologies. This, I, I think my video may not be working. This is my first time on uh, Starleaf. Um, I think the, 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 the settings, the settings are, 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 are clearly not, 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 not uh, dovetailing in relation to the camera, but at least my audio seems to be working. 
Have we so, had these issues before, Shane? Um, <laughs> um, you, you, believe me, you're, you're missing nothing, not, not having the audio. Okay, um, uh, thanks for, um, for us being able to come along today, and I'm glad we were all able to, to, to make it, and the, the technology is at least holding up to do the minimum. Um, um, today's topic is business preparedness for the end of the transition period. Um, this, is an, this is an important topic, but it's a worrying topic. And it's one where we've gotten more concerned as time has moved on, and yet so much else seems not to have moved very much. Um, with your permission, Chair, I, I, I will just talk a little before probably getting uh, Julie involved to talk in a little more detail around business preparedness, and then Victor will, will, will sweep up with some further material on, on, on some areas around the likes of trade and, and, and migration. But I, th I think it will be pretty apparent from the, the slide deck that was shared in advance that you know, there, we have a significant level of concern. You know, in, in short, the evidence currently points to pretty low levels of preparedness by business. We were probably already concerned about preparedness and then COVID came along and that made things immensely more difficult. For an awful lot of firms out there, COVID is today's problem mm. and they're trying to keep their heads above water. We all know and many business groups will come to the committee and call for certainty. They crave certainty. Um, and so businesses constantly express a lot of frustration about clarity and that that's really in very short supply at the minute. Frustration that things of this magnitude need clarity along with time to prepare and time to adjust. And that's not just clarity in relation to the EU-UK free trade agreement and negotiations, but it's also in relation to GB Northern Ireland trade and the fleshing out of that system. So that clarity is not always there in how things will work because a lot of key things are still being negotiated in one form or another between the UK government and the EU. And obviously, you know, time is short. We're now measuring things in days. In addition, that clarity is not always there in some things that have actually been decided because those things also need systems to go alongside them. And some of those systems are still being built and still being constructed. And companies have never actually, they don't actually have any experience of using them. So well, at, that, at that high level, the picture is very concerning. You know, major changes are on the way in January. Some of those changes are not visible, but we're at the 11th hour. Some of those changes can be anticipated and we have resources in place to encourage and help businesses to prepare. And we'll talk about, a bit about that later. But even on, on this more stable ground, businesses are really struggling to actually get around to make those preparations because of what they have on their plate with COVID. Yep. I'm speaking very candidly. As things stand, we're anticipating a very, very difficult January. And at that point, I'll pass on to Julia to get into some, some more of the detail and then Victor will, will, will follow up. Julia? Thanks, Jane. Hopefully um, people can hear me. Um, I suppose I'll give an overview of the major, cha the major challenges as we see them. Um, as Shane said, we worry about business preparedness, you know, it's because we worry about disruption in the economy and in supply chains and how that would affect you know, our wider society. Um, the slides, I hope, give, well, particularly the figures on the slides, give an indication of the scale of the challenge we have in front of us. Um, I always go back to that intertrade figure of 9% of businesses having a plan in place. That's um, very, very, very worrying. Um, when we think about business preparedness, I suppose that takes in every single issue around EU exit. Not all of those issues will be as disruptive as others. Um, 
And so we have a particular concern around issues that will be disruptive if businesses aren't prepared. Customs is one that comes well at the very top of that list, I think, for TFE. It's worth, I suppose, those figures lay out a quite a, a stark kind of picture in front of us for January, but it's worth bearing and kind of laying the wider context around that, in that um, preparedness will look different, different for different business to businesses. So um, we should expect sort of commercial decisions you know, when, the, when the full reality of the kind of the commercial costs are known. Mm -hmm. So some businesses to prepare might be to, you know, to put in place systems to do what they're doing now. Some businesses will do things differently, whether that means, say, not uh, um, not receiving personal data from the EU or not, you know, or purchasing more locally. And the other piece of the jigsaw I think is important to bear in mind is that particularly GB and I trade, the preparedness of NI traders is just one part of the jigsaw. If GB businesses aren't ready to sell to NI, then that's a big, big issue for us. I particularly worry about that one in that um, Northern Ireland businesses will at least have been bombarded with messages around the protocol, at least in their consciousness, some idea of what they have to prepare for. Um, GB businesses are pro may not have the same um, of the issues that might arise and so may have a, a lower sense of the need to prepare. As Shane outlined, there's a lot of things about this year that we would have, would have wished would be different, but equally we can't change them. And in the last while we've tried to get the message to businesses uh, <clears throat> to prepare for what you can now, you know, you cannot wait for certainty on everything. You need to take whatever actions you can now and plan to take the next steps whenever you, you have them in front of you. Um, and so that being said, what actions are we taking? I suppose that action plan gives you some sense of the range of activity. Um, invest and Trade both have media campaigns ongoing. Um, we are talking to stakeholders an awful lot. Um, a key thing in the next while will be inf information. We can ask a lot about what we're doing to support businesses and what businesses tell us what is that the most important thing at the moment is clear information about what they need. So um, they told us that they is what a lot of businesses use already in terms of uh, looking for COVID schemes. So we've tried to direct businesses to that in terms of EU exit information, just to have one source of information, because I think it's quite uh, confusing to have to go to, uh, say, lots of different websites to get um, to get information. We also came up with that 10 steps checklist. I don't know whether the committee would have seen that, which is actions businesses can take now. And that's proved quite popular with stakeholders and businesses in terms of, well, for people who are prepared to remind them to sense check are they as prepared as they think and for a lot of businesses to, to sort of give steps that they can take now you know to try registering for tss um applying for an eori number and um, so it's those trying to get people to take the first steps is important i think um the communications aspect of this is very difficult as well i think um we're trying every avenue we can and working with stakeholders to try and get messages out, we speak to councils. However, particularly for, G for purchases from GB, I really do worry about micro and that we're not reaching enough of them. Um, say about 10,000 businesses bought from GB in 2018, about 9,000 of those were micro or small businesses. I am yeah, I would doubt that they are all registered with TSS. They are they have all URI numbers. That is a big challenge for us. Now there is support available from Invest and Intertrade, and I know Invest have kind of one-to-one -one sessions on, on offer to all businesses over the first two weeks of January or first two weeks of December. 
but it's getting the message out to businesses. There's a lot of on Brexit with the negotiations and um, a lot of other things. So it's sometimes hard, I think, to break through um, all the all the kind of news that people hear on Brexit to get to the here's what you need to know bit. And finally, I suppose, what I'd like to leave you with really is that business preparedness is a process that we're going to have to continue well into the new year. Um, not every business will be buying things on the 1st of January, you know, particularly for smaller businesses, their purchases might be more infrequent. So we need to be ready to help them when they meet frictions they're not prepared for. So, um, yeah, it's, we have an awful lot to do before the end of the year, but equally the work we do next year will be just as important. Um, I'll hand over to, I'm happy to take any questions, um, but maybe Victor wants to give an update first and we can, um, we can go from there. Okay, um, can you hear me, Chair? Yeah, we can, Victor, thanks. Great, thank, thank you and, and, and thanks Chair and, and members. Um, uh, as Shane said, uh, I'm sort of covering areas around uh, services trade, uh, around international trade and migration issues and just wanted to add a little bit to what both Shane and uh, Julia have said in terms of the kind of key issues um, that are uh, you know significant in those areas as businesses uh, seek to prepare for the and state broader stakeholders seek to prepare for the end of the uh, transition uh, period. So, um, just on services, uh, I, I mean a really critical issue that we are seeking to um, engage businesses on is the issue around data sharing uh, across borders. Um, uh, really important, something uh, I think, uh, you know, under GP, GDPR, uh, uh, something businesses have got used to and stakeholders have got used to, um, but maybe there's a, a degree of taking uh, that for granted and there is a, um, you know, change is coming at the end of the implementation period and that the hope is and the pressure from our executive and ministers is uh, for a data adequacy agreement to be put in place that would uh, continue uh, to allow data sharing to, uh, to, to take place. Um, but we haven't got to that point yet. And as others have pointed out, there is a lot of work uh, still to be done, you know, an uncertainty around what an, an agreement between the UK and the EU will deliver if there is one. Um, so, uh, I mean, th there are concerns as, as uh, and, you know, in similar scale of preparedness that Julia has pointed out, we as a department have done some specific survey work um, replicating a, a, a sort of a UK wide survey, uh, but focusing in on, on Northern Ireland businesses to identify what plans are in place for data sharing. That survey shows that only 6% of businesses have contingency plans uh, in place to address uh, a lack of a data adequacy uh, decision. 80% are saying that they have uh, not taken any preparatory work on at all in this space. So those just identify the need um, for engagement and all of this, although recognition, of course, of the difficult context that Shane uh, has already uh, pointed out. Those kind of figures that, uh, that I've, I've sort of presented there are more concerning than at the UK level as a whole. And I think that reflects uh, the fact that we are operating across a land border uh, in Northern Ireland um, and therefore that brings in many more SMEs into scope in that kind of trading uh, circumstance of where data sharing is important um, and again comes back to the point that some of this is perhaps uh, you know current context taken for granted um, and expected to continue so um, you know big issues there. Are. It's one of the issues that we've included in that top 10 issues for businesses to engage on. Um, and actually quite reassuringly, I was speaking to a stakeholder um, last week um, who had uh, you know, mentioned that there was, they were responding to those top 10 issues and particularly rechecking on 
the data point uh, to make sure that the, their house was in order. Now they were a larger business. Still think we have, um, you know, there's work to be done in terms of reaching out to SMEs. We're about to publish um, a service of tool which will uh, allow businesses of all sizes to identify the kind of risks and changes that might be coming their way um, in terms of both data adequacy and broader services trade issues um, so that we, we intend to put that out uh, shortly and I think that will help uh, along with the broader efforts that are going on to engage businesses in this agenda. On international trade, um, we're seeking to raise the profile of issues around our trading relationships uh, with countries, particularly those where the UK have not at this stage rolled over existing uh, FTAs. Um, I mean, we trade uh, as a region 1.8 billion in goods directly with FTA countries, those countries with which we have a, a free trade agreement in place by virtue of the implementation period, by virtue of having been members of the, uh, the EU. I mean, it's good. There was an announcement over the weekend about Canada being initialed with, um, uh, you know, that uh, getting into the green zone. Uh, that's a really significant uh, development for Northern Ireland because we trade a large part, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a large uh, amount of goods in, into Canada. Um, however, even to, Canada into account about a quarter of trade through those FTAs are with countries, Northern Ireland trade with those FTAs are with countries that still need to be rolled over by the UK. So Mexico, Turkey, Egypt, Singapore were all important trading partners for, for Northern Ireland. So we're working with um, I suppose we're working with UK government to, to seek to amplify uh, the, the risks and the messages around all of that, help businesses think through their supply chain and their customers and, and what all of this might mean for them. Um, but also we're looking at, uh, we've been engaging with Invest NI to look at bespoke engagement with client companies that might be undertaken to uh, sort of make sure that those companies have this on their radar rather it won't be an issue for all um so i think uh, we just need to you know take tailored approaches where that that is uh where that's appropriate on migration um we know that businesses will be required to adjust uh in the context of the new uk points uh, based system and the end of the freedom of movement, which is due for uh, introduction from the 1st of January 2021. Um, I mean, the clock is also ticking on the opportunity for people to apply to the settled status scheme that remains open until the middle of next year for those that are resident, uh, migra EU migrants that are resident in Northern Ireland before the end of the implementation period. Um, so. I mean, that's a, largely a, a, an issue that we're working with TEO who lead on that settled status piece. Um, but we're seeking to encourage employers uh, to promote the scheme to their workers and uh, families uh, and make sure they're aware of it and how they can engage with it. Um, uh, so, look, I mean, one of the, I suppose, the points just to finish up is, you know, our minister, the executive, continues to try and... Um, influence the shape of landing zones around all of this. So working with the UK government to identify the particular Northern Ireland issues uh, right across this agenda and uh, these agendas and, and others. Um, but also in tandem with that, then seeking to uh, inform businesses and shape their decision making as they um, grapple with EU exit alongside the other issues that they are, are needing to grapple with uh, at the minute. And that's, that's all I wanted to say, Chair. Um, thank you, Victor. Um, thank you for, for all of that. Um, that information, I think, is a, is a very sobering briefing th this morning. Um, and some of the, the figures in, in the, the, um, the pack around the level of preparedness are, are, are as you say, quite concerning. Um, I guess one of the things that we have been told as a committee from business representatives over the past number of weeks and months is the lack of bandwidth that businesses actually have to be able to prepare at this um, time because of, of the impact of COVID and trying to deal with all of that and Brexit is an added level, level then of, um, of disruption um, and potential for really, really serious impacts 
come the beginning of January. Um, I, and just this morning, there's been another quite downbeat assessment from Ursula van der Leyen about the, the progress in terms of, of negotiations um, and around the, the EU being prepared for a, a, a no deal outcome in, in respect of that. So I guess that will be one um, question that I have in relation to the contingency if there's a, a no a non-negotiated outcome, as, as it's called, in terms of um, a free trade agreement and being businesses being in any way um, ready for being able to trade at the beginning of January in, in that context. Um, just in relation to some of the, um, I guess, awareness raising for businesses, I, I've seen both um, British government and, and Irish government and heard on the radio ads campaigns about getting businesses to prepare either bespoke ones for businesses here because I haven't really seen those um, you know to be directed at through whether it's been I think you mentioned both invest and intertrade have um, media campaigns um, are they are they going to be rolled out in terms of TV or maybe I just haven't seen them um, yeah. or how, how are those being done um, <clears throat> Um, let's just see what else. Oh, and um, maybe we could maybe pick up on those couple of points, and then I'll come back in with a, a couple of others. Um, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, in terms of no deal, um, uh, there um, are sort of two two sort of two top top line issues at play there. Uh, in terms of no deal, our trade in goods. With the EU will, will will pretty much proceed as per the the, the, the protocol. Um, that obviously um, will will leave certain gaps and challenges in relation to services. And uh, Victor can pick up on anything if if, if you want to push more in that area. Uh, um, a no deal then brings further challenges in relation to GB and MI. It also brings further challenges in, in some areas where we, we, we have yet to see how those pan, pan out. Um, Julia Wolverelli mentioned the concerns around customs and no deals then brings the questions around um, tariffs, much more in, 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 into play. Um, in terms of media campaigns and what, what, what is currently happening and what's in the pipeline again I'll, I'll pass over to Julia she'll be able to talk more about what 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 promotion is in is in play and she may also want to add a, a few things around um how a, a lack of a deal at the at the EU UK level will impact on that um in particular GB to MI flow Julia Thanks, um, Shane. Yeah, I suppose at-risk goods is a particular concern in terms of the shape of a deal or if there isn't a deal between the UK and EU. Um, if there is a zero tariff deal, logically you would expect at-risk to be a much easier issue to resolve and to create much less friction for, for businesses. If there isn't a deal, well, um, that becomes that much more difficult. No, um, we haven't been involved in negotiations on that. I understand they're ongoing. Um, that is one I would be very concerned about if there isn't a deal. In terms of um, media campaigns, as I, we, we can come back to you with um, maybe more briefing on this, but as I understand it, there's a good bit online which um, I think might be optimised in terms of what you're searching online, so you mightn't see that if you're um, depending on what Kind of things you're looking up, you you might see that more than um, more than uh, the ordinary person would. So anyway, I can get you more information on that. I think it's all also in local newspapers and um, well, the investment I think is also in print and also some radio. Um, but uh, we, if the committee would be interested, we can certainly come back with more information in terms of. Um, should we have a campaign here, you know, advising businesses to prepare? I'm, at this stage, general message is that effective in terms of, you know, businesses need to prepare. I think our businesses know well, they do need to do things. I think it's not, not 
RSA it hasn't helped. So um, I think rather than my personal view would be rather than a broad messages of you need to prepare, I think given the limited time left, the message needs to be more tailored probably in terms of if you do X, you need to do Y, you know, um, because businesses really have so little time and those general messages, um, they rely on a business to then kind of figure out what they need to do to prepare. And um, well, that's been very difficult so far, but it's not going to get any easier, I don't think. Just to come in behind that again, uh, obviously uh, none of us are, are PR folks, and uh, when it comes to the effectiveness of different channels of communication, you know that's, that's where we rely on the, the likes of the Executive Information Service to understand what, what will be effective at, at, at getting messages out. One of the one of the steers has been that um, you know, the, the use of the use of ministers uh, can be effective at, at getting messages out, and you probably have seen that the, that the minister has been um, encouraging through the likes of uh, sort of social media channels and so forth to in, 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 uh, to, to try and encourage businesses onto that that central resource that is um, NI Business Info. To, to encourage businesses to 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 go through that checklist, the ten steps, and take the the the, the, the subsequent action. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and it would be useful if we could get a, a further um, briefing at some point in relation to to what is planned in terms of, of media. Um, and I guess even directing businesses to to the NI Business Info um, ten point um, checklist that that is there. Um, might be a useful starting point for, for them. Um, and I guess that brings me to one of my, my next questions. Do we have any idea of the numbers in, in terms of take up to the Trader Support Service and in terms of getting their EORI numbers um, and how you know, businesses are, are finding that um, process? Um, and just to go back to, to your point around um, at risk goods, um, Julia, if, um, have we any? Um, indication of progress in relation to that particular issue. Um, obviously, it was one that, uh, when we have asked questions about, we are told that there's consultation ongoing with business representatives and, and things like that through the, the NIO. Um, so it would be useful to maybe get um, some um, update on that if there is any. And also further in relation to the internal market bill, has there been any um, ongoing um, engagement in respect of that? Um, uh, are you, are you happy to take those? Did my sound cut out there? <laughs> Do you need me to repeat um, anything? Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, would you mind repeating the first two questions? Um, I don't know if I can remember what they were. But yeah, I think it was in relation to the Trader Support Service yeah. and the EORI numbers. Um, have we any an indication of what uptick has been Internal in relation market to bill, I think businesses? Mentioned it. Um, and if there is any update in terms of progress around the definition of at risk goods. Okay, great. Uh, so, on the Trader Support Service in particular, um, HMRC do have figures. Um, I would check with them in terms of what can be shared with the committee. My sense is that, say, if the um, if 10,000 businesses in 2018 were buying from GB, I, I don't, the level of registration is not 10,000. And if you also take into account that they need GB businesses to register as well. So um, if you can say, you know, you could say every NI business is buying from at least one business in GB. So that would say you'd need at least 20,000 businesses. Realistically, it's probably a lot more than that that you need to have registered. And you also need to have hauliers registered. I think um, I don't have any sense, but that we are in the very early stages of where we be by the end of the year in terms of registrations for TSS. On EORI numbers, um, the committee might have seen some of the social media um, kind of stuff on this. In that, so businesses will need both a GB EORI number and an XI EORI number. The, the process for getting an XI URI number hasn't yet opened. Um, I'm told there'll be more clarity in the next week or two in terms of 
what businesses need to do to do that. Every business that's registered with TSS will get an XI URI number automatically, but others will have to go through some sort of um, manual process of applying. On EORI numbers more generally, I know that um, uh, HMRC had automatically allocated EORI numbers to businesses that trade with the EU. Obviously, it's a much more complicated picture in that um, HMRC, because it's internal UK trade, have no idea which businesses um, purchase from GDB, so they cannot do it automatically. So. We need businesses to register for URI numbers, and it's very difficult to target who needs to register. Um, my sense is that larger businesses, medium, medium businesses, are probably well ahead, well ahead of the game on that one. And it's smaller businesses who have never had to engage with customs in this way before that I would worry about. Um, on, at risk goods. Um, I don't have a great update to be honest. It's I know negotiations are ongoing. Um, it seems it seems tied to the question of uh, tariffs and quotas and the overall deal. So I would expect um, movement on that to be kind of in time with movement on the overall deal. I. <laughs> it's very very difficult for businesses to make decisions on, you know, their supply chains without knowing that they're going to incur a tariff liability. That's um, particularly in the current circumstances where a lot of businesses um, with COVID have had a lot of pressure on cash flow. The prospect, you know, more uncertainty and particularly more uncertainty around debt is just not something that businesses can countenance at the moment. Um, and so, some businesses, um, some it won't worry in that they might have looked, uh, looked through the tariff codes and worked out how big the liability would be in a worst case. But, you know, profit margins are not massive. You know, even a tariff of 1% to 3% would, would probably go a long way to reducing your profit on particular goods. And finally, I think it was the um, UK Internal Market Bill. I'm afraid that's another one that I don't have a great update on. And that's um, advice with the Minister on how to proceed. Um, it's obviously a complex bit of legislation. I know it's at report stage currently. Um, and that the bill looks a good bit different than it did when it was introduced. Equally, I think the government has said they intend to um, reinsert clauses that uh, the Lords have removed. So. It, um, we'll be watching very closely how um, how the UK internal market bill is handled in Parliament, and we'll be liaising closely with the Minister on what what she wants to do next and um, any decisions the executive should make on it. Um, thanks for that, Julia. And I guess that that is our, our very real concern in all of this. The, the the very late hour that it is in terms of businesses being able to prepare in any meaningful way before the end of the year and the fact that it will likely be um, a few weeks yet before they know <coughs> what they're trying to prepare for um, and the, the lack of, as we said earlier, bandwidth in terms of you know having any capability or, or financial resource to do so. So just in, res in respect of that, um, is the department planning to make any specific funding available to support businesses? Um, there was announcements earlier this week about um, small business loans being made available in the south. Uh, in respect of business or Brexit preparation, is there any plans for anything similar um, here? Um, I think I saw that announcement as well. It was Microfinance Ireland, I think. Um, Support is available through Invest and through Intertrade. Um, they both have either Brexit vouchers or Brexit grants on offer. I I have not heard from either body that uh, they are overwhelmed. You know that money is still available, and we would really encourage businesses to avail of it. We also recognise um, support. You know we're going to need more support next year. Uh, um, we have. 
bid through DOF to Treasury for that, and that I think support to business. Um, our minister has been very clear in implementing the protocol. Support for businesses is a vital part of that, and so for you to do this properly, you need to support businesses through it. Um, so um, there's there's the support that's available there. We recognise the property needs to be more. Well, it's hard to predict how January and February will go, but equally we would intend putting more support in place for the next financial year, provided that Treasury and DOF can um, provide that funding to us. Yeah, no, I just, I, just, I, go ahead. Just, just to say, the, you know, the, the, the take-up, as Julia has said, of some of the support to date has, has not been as great as you might expect for the situation, and that's part of why we worry. In that you know there if businesses were taking the steps to pre prepare we would expect greater, greater pressure on the invest ni and the intertrade ireland voucher schemes and support schemes for, for for helping businesses transition and we're not seeing the level of uptake and pressures that you might expect given the the the, the march of time yeah, and I think it, it is a case that is implementation um, support is also going to be important um, after the beginning of January. So thanks for, for that from me, and I'm going to hand over to, to Stuart, your, your first one. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you very much for your, your presentation this morning. And you, you opened it by saying that business certainty was the most important aspect around all of this. And yet here we are sitting today, deal or no deal. Um, that certainly isn't providing business certainty. But on the assumption that something might be cobbled together at the last minute, which is the sort of general nature of these sorts of things, so let, let's make the assumption that we, we do get some sort of deal. At this very late stage, and without knowing what would be in the deal, do you foresee any room for flexibility? So th there will inevitably be bits in the deal that people will welcome, but there will equally well be bits in the deal that are either impractical or somebody hasn't fully thought, thought, thought through. Will there be, do you foresee any opportunity, particularly if this goes against Northern Ireland businesses, do you foresee any opportunity to redress uh, what potentially could be an absolutely an absolute bear trap in the middle of, of any deal for Northern, for Northern Ireland? My second area of question is, you made a lot of comment about um, Northern Ireland small businesses' awareness about, um, or lack of awareness about trade into the GB market, uh, or trade with GB, but to what estimate do you have of GB businesses having any awareness of their ability or inability or different barriers being put up? to them uh, to trade into Northern Ireland. There are lots of businesses in, in the UK that, that quite naturally think of us as just being one place and uh, trade away. Lots of stuff comes by post and mail, uh, small items and things like that. And if there's, a, if there's, a, if there's an issue about that, it, yes, it's important that, that we drill down to the very smallest businesses here in Northern Ireland and get them to understand that they need to register, that they need things, there may be things that they're going to have to do. Uh, but is there, any, is there any equal and opposite campaign? I appreciate that the two markets are completely different sizes, but is there any equal and opposite campaign uh, in the rest of the UK to alert them to uh, what might happen to being able to do business in Northern Ireland? And, and, and finally, just as a general comment, it, it seems to me, listening to you this morning, that you're, you're simply struggling to give us any information. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Um, um, we, we, we do struggle to give you information in areas where we ourselves do not have information. And um, I, I, you know, I think we, at the risk of going over some of the things we, we have before, you know, Negotiations between the EU and the UK, and we're not just talking about the FTA negotiations, but also flashing out of the protocol. Um, these things have, have yet to be decided. Um, in many cases, we're, we're, we're not in the driving seat, we're not necessarily in the rooms. And so, um, 
unfortunately, um, we don't always have the information. We don't have the foresight. And so we do not know how things will necessarily pan out. And um, you know, we'd rather be honest about that rather than speculate that it, it may turn out one way or the other. In terms of business certainty, and, and you talked about um, on the assumptions that there would be a deal and, 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 and the adjustment for that, I think that's what we talked about earlier. Businesses would crave certainty. They would crave um, knowing in advance. They would want that uh, to involve uh, periods where things are phased in. They would want to, uh, that to involve uh, time to adjust. They would want to um, have trial runs at using systems. Mm -hmm. So um, the question of whether this would involve sort of pathways to uh, compliance and implementation, whether this would involve transition periods, whether this involves grace periods, um, ultimately those are things which are political negotiations between the EU and the UK. And I suppose in short, we're not in the room to understand whether those things are on the table and being discussed or are off the table. Uh, unfortunately, we're not in a position to confirm or deny whether that sort of flexibility um, um, can, can, can be part of the overall outcome. Certainly what we hear, and it's probably no different to what you hear, would be that in the context of an overall deal, the potential for flexibilities and transitions and pathways you know, there are, are, are likely to be, um, you know, that, that's a likely to be a, a more favorable setting compared to uh, in, in the old deal situation. You also brought up um, about awareness um, in, in relation to the, the, the GB side, and um, uh, we talked about earlier uh, up, uh, uptake of TSS. We also talked about earlier that um, um, when it comes to trade with GB, it takes it does take two to tangle. Yeah. A buyer and seller in Northern Ireland and a buyer and seller in GB, and we are worried on, 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 on the GB side. And um, we will try and get an indication uh, if we can. If we are allowed to share um, an update from TSS on, on the number of registrations, we, we will also see if we can get those for the, the GB side. But um, my understanding is the GB registrations are at least as concerning, if not more concerning, than the Northern Ireland side. Do you give you an indication of our, our, our reasonable expectations as to the levels of Northern Ireland expect? Uh, uh, registrations we might expect, and that we would expect at least the same on on on, on the GB side. And I think there's also a, a big communication challenge on the GB side in that it's 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 very easy for GB traders to be focused on the deal with the EU, as opposed to um, the outworkings of um, a, a, a protocol for you know what is a a, you know, a small market within the. The, the 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 UK and these are genuine risks and genuine concerns about um, um, parts of the relationship, parts of the supply chain, which I suppose are outside our direct reach and jurisdiction. I don't know if Julia wants to say any more. Any any of those three points? Um, in terms of communications um, in GB. Shane is right, the whole focus has been on you know trade with the EU. There are if you've seen some of UK government kind of as you see, there is a Northern Ireland section, but um I think you'd first need a business to realise that trade with Northern Ireland and need to be very to find us perhaps. Um we have been advising all our businesses to talk to their suppliers and through that to try and raise awareness of their suppliers of what they should need to do. Um, I am also planning, well, later this week, planning to talk to the Scottish and the Welsh governments to see is there anything, any potential to do anything in terms of business messaging. You mentioned kind of parcel 
parcel operators and businesses getting small packages, it's that's one I, I really do worry about in that there's an awful lot of kind of online marketplaces and I have a case came across my desk maybe a year ago of some um, online site not selling to Northern Ireland. Now, there was no particular, it was um, a misunderstanding of customs really. So we're, as well as the real issues that businesses will have to deal with, we also face the potential that um, there will be a perception that maybe you can't sell to Northern Ireland anymore. And so we need to face both perception and to get businesses ready for the reality so it's uh yeah there's just as many challenges in gb as there are here and the consequence of that sorry chair would be that you know businesses in the uk either rightly or wrongly informed about the rules and regulations might just decide that they're not putting their thousand pound widget in the post to some business in northern ireland because uh, they just don't want it stuck in the middle of some customs debacle. Uh, so it is important that the information flow is a two-way flow. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree entirely. Um, it's... Yeah. Okay, Chair, thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Um, John O'Dowd, can we bring John into the spotlight, please? John, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not okay. Can you hear me now, Chair? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation with Clara and your questions. Um, this week has been marked with some optimism, and a lot of optimism, in fact, uh, around COVID-19 and the hope that there's going to be a vaccine rolled out at the end of this year and into January. And that in itself lifted the spirits of businesses, uh, of the general public, of health workers, that there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but there doesn't appear to be a vaccine for Brexit. Um, we are, as Shane said, you know, we are in for a very, very difficult January. What? And this is a, a general question, so I accept this is not your responsibility. This question is not your responsibility. What needs to be done? to give the same amount of optimism that there is around the ending of, of the COVID pandemic uh, to businesses and the public in relation to Brexit. Where's the optimism on that? Seriously? Does he listen to Megan? Um, um, okay. Um, uh, ultimately, that's not a question that, 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 that we can deliver on. Um, I, I think it goes back to what, what I talked about earlier. You know, Businesses have had, I suppose, four and a half years of uncertainty. <laughs> They've had four and a half years of knowing that things are going to change in some way or another, but not four years of um, clarity around a pathway towards what. And um, ultimately, we are set here, whatever it is, you know, something less than 40 days around um, 40 days away from, or less than 40 days away from some very significant changes. We don't know what all those changes are, and we don't know all the systems that will run those changes, never mind having um, experience in trialing them. Um, after four and a half years, um, businesses crave uncertainty, whether that's the equivalent of a vaccine, I, I, I don't know, but I think that's the that, that's the, the minimum that businesses want and expect. Okay, well, well just in terms of... Can I, of, of, can I just, sorry. Right. Go ahead. All right, sorry. Uh, no, just, uh, just a, a quick addition to that, I suppose. Uh, you know, there's... One of the points that I had mentioned earlier was the, the work that the executive is doing to try and make sure that, the, you know, negotiators, UK government, uh, 
uh, understand what would be helpful landing zones from a Northern Ireland perspective and all of this. So they've been pretty clear and consistent all along um, that, you know, a zero uh, tariff, zero quota, um, you know, deal is required and something that early that gives as, as much time for businesses to prepare and all of this. Uh, they've been, you know, clear in terms of managing uh, the flow of goods between you know what's needed and, and, and writing to the EU side to make sure that there is uh, uh, sensible approaches taken to, to all of that. So I don't, I, I don't think that maybe gets into your answer to the, is that a vaccine? Um, but I think you know the hope is that um, the kind of things that the executive have been, have been playing for and asking uh, the negotiator, negotiators to deliver, that we'll, we'll be able to find a way of getting close to those. So it's not, it's not that they haven't been pointing out what's needed, I, I suppose, is the point I'm making. Okay, thank you. Um, and in terms of communications with business, um, how many people... It, I understand that there's a media strategy, and I want to return to that in a second. But actual f individuals available, whether in the department or in Invest NI, who are actually physically either on the phone, and I know it's difficult to, to visit businesses during the COVID-19, but how much actual contact is there with business uh, from the department? I use that term loosely because there may be other agencies involved in this. How many people are actually involved in that? communication, lifting the phone, whatever it may be, to uh, businesses saying, look, this is what you need to do. Uh, I'm here to offer you advice. Uh, there's a number of useful links online, etc. Does that happen? Is those resources available to yourselves or to another uh, branch of the department to be doing that? Well, starting at the department, um uh, a lot of our engagement with, with, with businesses through our uh, stakeholder forum, these happen regularly. I think the, 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 the latest was the 28th uh, meeting, which was, was, was earlier this, this month. And that's got a, a whole host of the, um, not just um, individual businesses, but uh, the business representative organizations, the trade bodies. And that's, that's, that's a network for, for, for us to get messages out and for them to pass those messages on to their to their members, and then also for the reverse for their members to put in their views and so forth. And that's th th those those are like two way two way channels for us to gauge views to feed into uh, UK government policy and so forth. And then secondly, to actually feed out information. Uh, then we go into uh, um, invest NI. And into trade, and again, they have their their a their links to business, which are which which are well established, and b their 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 communication, their knowledge communication routes, which publicise the the, the the support available. And again, um, you, you'll have seen the the action plan around communications that was shared shared with the committee, and that's um, you know the the additional material that we're going to be doing. And that we are doing in relation to trying to get as many businesses as possible to take those preparedness steps to go onto NI Business Info, to go through the 10 steps, to understand what 10 steps apply to them, and use those resources to get as prepared as best they can, bearing in mind the, 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 the limitations. I don't know if Julia wants to say anything more about this. Um, yeah, I was. Um... I was just going to say, so every client executive in Invest will be contacting you know, the businesses they have a relationship with on this. Um, Intertrade don't have the same kind of client relationships, um, but councils um, have relationships with businesses. We've been in touch with them to try and get key messages out. It, um, it's a difficult area in terms of particularly people who purchase from GB as a lot of you know invest focus would be on increasing exports or external sales you know we don't often have a lot of visibility on people's supply chains into making a product you know usually what we focus on in terms of economic development is uh, outputs rather than inputs so that makes it difficult but i will say um i know mine victor and mary's teams are all very aware of our need to support businesses. So I don't think any of us would have ever refused a meeting with a business. I talk to businesses regularly 
who who do get in contact, whether through um, through uh, contacting the minister or um, I know um, a lot of them get in touch with people like yourselves and um, letters follow. So we are very aware of the need to support businesses. Um, we don't have a personal relationship with a lot of businesses in the way that we could lift the phone to businesses we know will be Im impacted, but um, we are definitely all all aware of our need to support businesses and very willing to do that. Yeah, and it's not a criticism of yourselves in any way. Uh, it's physically impossible for the four of you uh, to contact every business the supplier uh, ahead of this and then we also have the problem in terms of that also has to be done by your equivalents in Britain to ensure that the businesses there are doing the same thing. So it's not, what I'm trying to get at is, do we need to actually uh, bring more people to this game in the sense of that we need a massive push uh, from the Department of the Economy uh, and others to ensure that businesses are aware of this? Because with your best efforts and the best efforts of Invest NI and the Executive Information Service, only 9% of businesses have a plan in place. So what is happening at the minute isn't working for a variety of reasons. And just before uh, I started to speak to you, I noticed a tweet from Invest NI, and the tweet is advertising business supports. Now, the tweet starts off by, and it's useful in its own context, uh, starting off that the, their latest edition of the two-minute update, we have information on our latest COVID-19 support schemes and how you can check your eligibility. There is also the latest information on the EU exit. Now, to me, that's a, pro, that's a, that's a tweet on its own. That's a social media campaign on its own. So my, my last comment is, in terms of the media and the social media, well, that's not your job to do that. Use other people with the information. Use, use, use understand this more than anyone. Is there an engagement between EIS and yourselves around what that campaign, what information needs to go out in that campaign and how best that is done? Now, I also was checking the, the information business info website and Julie, you had mentioned the 10 point action plan. And in fairness, when you go on to it, it is quite a useful tool. It's very self-explanatory. There's links to other uh, forms and information you need, but we need to get people to that. So. Is EIS engaging with yourselves? Um, for, first of all, um, in terms of, um, we discussed this topic at our last stakeholder group meeting. Well, we are open-minded about what we will do in comms. Um, and we asked our stakeholder group, made up of the business bodies and, and, and businesses, what, what is the best strategy? for um, communication around uh, pe penetrating businesses. And their, their, their clear, clear feedback was that we, we needed one shop window for that, that that shop window should be NI Business Info. And then the communication resources should be directed at pushing businesses onto that sing, 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 single shop front. Uh, as I understand it, and, and, and Julia can, can, can say more, we, we are open to using any communication channel that uh, communication and, and PR folks think that will work. Um, you know, it's, I have no, no their preconceptions. I'm no PR person. I'm happy to do any communication channel that we, that we think will work. And we, we, we do talk and we are having discussions with EIS, and EIS, as I understand it, have capacity to do work. They have the sort of um, the, 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 the mechanisms, the channels uh, to, to, to do that. But uh, ultimately, um, if, if, if the communications and PR folks think something will work, I'm absolutely prepared to do it. I don't know if Julia wants to say anything more about the, the, the EIS link. Um, no, I, um, I think that's exactly right. But, you know, I've, we speak to the minister regularly on this. She like oh, whatever we can to get messages out. It it's a diff, as I said previously, it's a difficult communication environment in that you know well it's just a very difficult time in general. But that that's just the context we're working in. So um, that's just something we have to accept. 
we um, will be talking to EIS. Um, there's a regular kind of communications update that does include them, um, which includes investing in trade as well. So um, yes, something that is on the table at the moment is what um, further use could be made of EIS. Um, we just, as I said earlier, be keen to make sure that that Raising awareness, I suppose, isn't good. Isn't good enough at the moment. We need to raise awareness and get people to take action. Because just knowing, you know, God, there's a big hill in front of you. You know, it doesn't do much for what we're facing in January. So, well, from the department, we we want to be sure that the action we take is effective. And anyway, it's as you say, it's been very challenging today, so I don't expect it to get any easier, but we will be doing everything we can, and that includes engaging with the EIS. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Good morning. Um, thank you very much for your uh, briefing so far, uh, and I feel your pain because um, your briefing on, on, on various issues that you actually do not know uh, what the end game is going to be and uh, I suppose we're five weeks out um, uh, um, uh, to the end of the transition period uh, and we're with more questions than any of us have answers. So uh, uh, and regarding just back to what John O'Dowd was saying, it, it's very difficult to have any type of PR campaign or information campaign when we don't actually know what we are trying to say or what our messages are because we have no clear indication of what the deal is going to be but we we have some indications that that 95 percent of the negotiations are now complete uh, and, and and it's just the three areas the fisheries the governance and the level playing field that are still difficult which are major major issues and then playing into that uh, you know we we have got difficulties around aviation energy road haulage and rules of origin and they're all playing into to the issues within northern ireland in the context of Northern Ireland. So um, I just, uh, uh, there has been speculation that there will be um, some sort of deal, as, as I've said, but there's also speculation that there might be a six month implementation phase uh, and some, um, of some of some sort. What are your thoughts about this? And could the phasing relate to uh what, what what the facing could relate to uh, and what kind of supports and help that you uh, and your team could be doing in, in the implementation of this six months also there's indications and reports in the media that dara um, now accepts that they won't have the structures in place uh within the ports um for for sps inspections is that correct and uh what what is your indication that this can be completed within six months as well? Okay, uh, thank thank you. And you know, you know th th this is th this certainly is uh, difficult for the communication folks um, um, to 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 get across messages around encouraging businesses to take action on the parts of outcomes which are known while not taking action on out, on the parts of outcomes which have yet to be re revealed. You know, that, that, that's, that's not an easy sell for any business, particularly when, when, when the business is maybe trying to keep its head above water with, 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 with COVID. Um, I think those, to bear in mind, those that um, reference 85% of a deal being done or 85% of a deal being converted into the, the, the legal text, obviously that relates to the EU uh, UK free trade agreement, uh, and uh, over and above that, we, we uh, yes, there will be linkages from that clarity across to the uh, protocol. But there are obviously areas of the protocol uh, on a standalone basis which uh, need some fleshing out. They need systems to be fully revealed and fully operationalized and fully used and tested. And um, so that, that ninety five percent doesn't necessarily translate across to. Uh, 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 a, a protocol um, in the protocol side of things in terms of speculation to, to six months uh, you know, I, I have no idea I'm not in the room to understand whether um, whether um, those things 
are on the table or uh, you know, certainly the informed speculation out there or what would claim to be informed speculation would suggest that in the event of a deal, you know, things around flexibilities become much more possible. Um, I think, as I said before, right at the outset, um, you know, their businesses, you know, their are very clear and that they say that they want a clear outcome they want a pathway which gives them an opportunity to make the changes to gain the knowledge to uh, you know their skill up their their their, their workforce and um you know, very much something in the space of a managed transition and i i imagine um firms would would welcome that but you know, we're we're not sitting here today with any particular insight as to whether that will will, will occur or not. The the, the position uh, to date has always been one that the the um, the transi transition period ends at the end of December. And that has been the, the 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 clear public line for for as long as um, I can recall. I don't know whether Victor, in terms of the the EU negotiations wants to add anything like that, or Julie wants to add anything in relation to the protocol, Victor? Just, uh, just briefly. Um, uh, I mean, uh, absolutely. The 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 noise around that, the play, I suppose, from from stakeholders is intensifying, and and that's uh, that's becoming pretty clear and apparent. I mean, there's there's no sense that um, positions are changing around the negotiating table on all of this that we're picking up. Uh, but yeah, there, there, there's, there's no doubt it, it, there's a, a bigger request for that uh, managed well, transition, I suppose. In that context, um, it's really important that we get um, that that a deal, a, a deal is done and that's the right deal. Um, I mean, even if there was a, a some kind of a, a you know, a, an opportunity to um, delay the, the implementation of that or adjust to the implementation of that for six months or whatever. You want to be, for the long term, get, getting the right deal. And I think that's where the, the priority needs to be. And I think that's where the executive I mentioned previously uh, to, to, to John O'Dowd, that's where um, the, the executive is seeking to, to place um, uh, influence and uh, make sure that the deal that's done works for Northern Ireland as best as we possibly can uh, make it work for Northern Ireland. Thank you for that, Victor, and I totally agree. Uh, it's important if there is any flexibility um, on on the implementation um, that that we have time to prepare and time to adjust. And that's that's uh, that's really what I'm talking about. It's not about um, uh, an extending of, of this negotiation because it's been painful enough to date. Um, and we just need clarity on what the deal is, and then our businesses then can step up to the table and make the the appropriate preparations. And that because it really is very worrying when you look at the data that uh, was sent through to us and, and the level of preparedness. They're not prepared. Not prepared. It's not that they don't want to be prepared, they don't know what to prepare for. So in the absence of that certainty, uh, then there, we've got you know everybody in the headlights uh, just waiting for clarity and then they will uh, move in uh, and get operational. But January is going to be tough. Um, if, if there is no flexibility in that preparedness and adjustment, it's going to be tough for businesses, it's going to be tough for our small business and that's what we are. We're a very small business uh, economy uh, with very little resources for, for that level of preparedness. So um, I am concerned, I'm concerned uh, at all levels and as I say, the, the bandwidth, uh, as, as the Chair said, for um, our business community at the minute with COVID and the preparations and, and impact of that um, it is tighter and tighter. So uh, as we are, we're counting down the days now, uh, literally, and uh, it's just regrettable that we've got to this. And I'm, I'm hoping that there's not just games playing um, within the UK EU uh, part because this is having a real impact. Sorry, did I cut across you, Julia? <laughs> no, I was um, I was just going to say that you know it sort of links to the wider communication effort. We mm -hmm. like. I think most businesses would welcome, you know, six months implementation or whatever, but we need to really convince businesses 
to prepare for January, you know, and to not to. There has been so many sort of extensions and um, <laughs> to date in the Brexit process that I think some businesses might have an idea of that this would, you know, there'd definitely be another extension. I don't think we can, you know, for our own work on preparedness, we really need to focus on getting people ready for January. You know, wonderful if there was some announcement, but um, it's, um, yeah, our main focus will be just trying to get them ready for January and trying to get that message out. And, and, and I really didn't get uh, any clarity about the, the infrastructure in the ports. Um, have you any idea um, w when that will be ready? Because that's going to have an impact on delays um, at our ports uh, and also will be very off-putting for, for uh, those that are sailing into Northern Ireland as well. Um, and, and, and what kind of work is is being pushed and is there extra uh, support being given to the boards to make sure that they are ready in time? Um, th these are these are uh, areas of responsibility for, for for Dara to take forward the 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 the, the necessary facilities. Um, certainly, I'm aware that that that, that uh, there are significant difficulties on that on that front. And unless Julia wants to say anything particular, I'm, 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 you know, uh, I'm a wee bit reluctant to sort of um, um, uh, uh, give the dear a position without sort of double checking with them that my interpretation and, uh, of that is, 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 is accurate. So you know, I think we'd happily come back to you. Uh, to, 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 to reflect the, the, the DR position as opposed to any of our, you know, their interpretation of it from the, from the, the last information that we, that we might have had on it. Are you comfortable with that, Julia, that we'll, we, 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 we'll see to get a, you know, their, the, the latest up-to-date position in DR's own words from them? Um, yeah, I think that's right. There's an, I know that there's an awful lot of work going on in DERA and, um, well, and that this is an area where things move quite quickly, so I just wouldn't want to give any give the wrong position. So I think Shane is right. We're better coming back with to you um, in writing, perhaps with um, some content from Dira. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair, um, and, and thanks to everyone for the presentation. Obviously, it has been quite lengthy. There have been a lot of uh, questions which uh, already have been answered or, or answered in the best way that you can, given the limited amount of uh, information that is available. Uh, so, so I do thank you for that. Um, I, do, I do have a few points that I want to raise. Obviously, uh, COVID has already been mentioned, uh, and, I, and I agree with the point that COVID has created uh, so much and if anything, it has highlighted uh, the real um, fact that you know, all of the best made plans in this world are, are fragile. Uh, so, so no matter how well we plan, at times you know, it just turns out that you know, things don't always work out in the way that we'd hoped for. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the communication piece and working with uh, stakeholders, uh, Julia, you mentioned around sort of your concerns and, and sort of maybe the department's concerns around the GB businesses and, and the impact that will have and the knowledge maybe that they would have in terms of the implications for them in terms of Northern Ireland. Uh, I am, however, uh, concerned, and maybe you could uh, highlight for us in terms of what engagement has taken place with their counterparts. You'd said maybe that a call would take place this maybe the Scottish and the Welsh counterparts. I'm assuming that you know, over this past four years there have been a lot of conversations in that respect and, and certainly over this past uh, six months uh, I'm assuming that there have been many more uh, conversations about how our counterparts in the mainland can ensure that those businesses are aware of their obligations I appreciate within the confines of the information available. Um. No, sorry, it, it, there, there has been, yes, and I know HMRC and TSS have been very engaged in this position of how to find out which businesses in GB are in the first place. Um, so there is an awful lot of work going on. It's, um, I would still see it as a big risk, though, to be honest. It's um, it, simply because 
it's very difficult. Um, well, we don't have an assurance that every business selling from GB to Northern Ireland is registered with TSS. I don't think it would be possible to get that by the end of the year. And so, given that fact, I think we need to see that as a big risk. Um, and particularly where um, the focus of managing AGB businesses will be on in the next five weeks, probably do, doing what they need to do to, to um, change their plans in reaction to whether this is a deal or not a deal with the EU, that the Northern Ireland element mightn't have the highest um, profile, um, just even in the media, in terms of kind of you'd expect the EU deal to have primacy. Okay, uh, th thanks for that, and I do welcome that clarification. It is important that uh, those communications do continue to happen. But also, as you have said uh, already, we need to cut through some of the, the megaphone diplomacy that we see in social media. Uh, we do have to be mindful that you know, for the past four and a half years, uh, we've heard a lot of scaremongering and fear from those who will never accept the democratic decision. Uh, and the will of the people of the United Kingdom. I appreciate that there will be those who uh, are unhappy at that decision, but the reality is that it has been made. And I think the businesses out there, what they want to see is certainty and clarity. Uh, the businesses have accepted the result. Uh, we need to cut through that and get to the point where uh, the EU and the UK can, can come to agreement. I think that you know there's a consensus in that respect and that, look, we all want to see a deal that is uh, sensible, but we can't have is sort of that one-sided uh, protocol solution which will uh, do ultimate damage uh, to local businesses. So that's really all I want to say. I do really appreciate uh, the update that you've given. Uh, probably not an awful lot new in it, but that's no reflection on yourselves because you are, are obviously working a lot of hours and working tirelessly to try and give as much certainty uh, to the businesses and to our committee as you can. So thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Um, Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks to the, the panel for uh, doing your best with difficult communications today, and I appreciate that. Just a point of clarification, early on we talked about the percentage of businesses had made no preparation. Was it 80%? Was that, was that correct? Can anyone clarify that? Certainly, on, uh, sorry, certainly in terms of the, um, the data position, I'd, I'd sort of I presented some figures. Yeah. So, uh, eighty percent of respondents on our, our uh, data preparedness question had indicated that they had taken forward no preparatory work at that stage, and that's not that long ago. Actually, it's just a few few weeks ago that that survey uh, was conducted. Julie, I think you have something more broadly on just from the intertrade uh, and maybe the chamber, NI Chamber of Commerce work, but it's in a similar space. Remember? Um, no, I, I was just going to say that that the eighty percent figure was from uh, Victor's presentation on data. In terms of um, the figures I'm aware of, or I'm trying to bring to my mind what the Chamber of Commerce ones say and the Intertrade ones, I think Brexit preparedness is such a wide issue. I I find it hard. I don't know if there's reliable statistics in terms of whether people have taken any action. Yeah, because an all a lot of people would have taken some action, even in terms of reading kind of the news or going to various links on websites. But it's whether they're prepared for everything of what they need to be prepared for is the worry. Um, so, okay. I think the eighty percent figure that I mean, you referred what? to was the data one. Yeah. It's obvious. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the uh, uh, sorry, um, Gordon, but one of the. Uh, uh, you know, interesting and, and difficult points, I suppose, uh, from surveys that are being done uh, by Intertrade, by the Chamber of Commerce, is uh, giving an indication that businesses are less prepared this time around for the end of the implementation period than they were the last last time around whenever we were coming towards the you know um, uh, the last time there was a risk of no deal uh, and the withdrawal agreement and all of that kind of thing be, being thought through um, and I suspect that is very much a reflection of just the impact of COVID and, and the, the impact that has had on businesses' bandwidth to think about these kind of issues. Um, so, you know, the level and and I I would caution not to put that down to a lack of effort and trying to help 
and support businesses prepare. But I think it's a reality that they just are, you know, um, they have lots of other issues to contend with and find it difficult to engage just as fully as they would like to with this agenda. You know, I think that was the point I was going to make, obviously COVID has been a priority. They're busy doing the day job. They're busy trying to, to meet all the demands on, of, of running a business. So, um, you know, that's probably a major factor. But the other point is well, been well made is the lack of clear information and direction on it, not from yourselves, but from many others that are involved. Uh, just my last point is a, something I've brought up before about businesses, especially manufacturing businesses at, at present, do require a considerable amount of documentation. Now, a lot of that documentation used to be hard copies, now it's electronic. So do you really think that if there are controls put in, and we trust them not be put in, but if there are controls put in, any further documentation will be a major barrier um, in, 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 in a structure that already is used to dealing with it. I'm thinking about documentation such as um, verification, say, on the quality and manufacturing standards, um, <coughs> quality certificates, certificates of conformity, and in fact, licensing documentation is another factor that's needed for some products. So there is a lot of documentation in, already in the system. So do you really feel that any additional is going to be a major factor? And it, obviously it is a cost, and the time delay is, is something we're all concerned about, and we trust that it will not be the case. But if there is some introduction of, of a form of documentation, do you think it's going to be a major hindrance and a cost to, to business here? Uh, um, on, on that, um, I think we have been, you know, we've been pretty clear, including uh, on material that we that, that, that we published, that the new frictions that lead to um, you know, new bureaucracy leads to new costs, and um, you know, ultimately, yeah, in order to you know, uh, minimize uh, impacts, those practicalities need to be ideally negotiated down or negotiated away. Um, and, and certainly frictions that end up in, in, in significant costs, significant paperwork, um, uh, sort of costly checks and so forth, over time will impact on trade, will impact on business. Um, um, that's that, uh, and um, I think there's work we published in the past, which pointed to that the, the practicalities really matter, and the more you can negotiate them away, you more you negotiate those those, those costs away, um, and uh, I think it's a, 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 an entirely fair sort of um, sort of con conclusion to make. Julia, I'm not sure if you want to add anything, but. Um, um, I was just going to add that customs is, I suppose, the one we worry about in that you're right, a lot of manufacturing businesses will be very familiar with goods regulation and um, familiar with what they have to do. I worry an awful lot about the businesses who have never done customs before. You'll know that kind of the, to take, to take yourself from not doing it at all to doing it is a big cost in terms of familiarizing yourself with things. Um, and I'm sure businesses will be aware of that from kind of new goods regulations that come in. There is a certain cost in just train, doing training or kind of acquiring new IT systems or whatever it is to uh, comply with the law. So I, I worry about the cost the businesses that have no experience of customs and who this will be entirely new to. Um, I also worry about say on goods regulation some businesses will have a lot of experience you're right the business i worry in the same vein about the businesses who have no experience of goods regulate you know say non-manufacturers say you're a, yeah. say of the an awful lot of the small and micro businesses that buy from gb or retail um they will have to take a new interest in goods regulation in a way they haven't had to do before so i would worry about them as well Okay, it's important, obviously, that if we can eliminate it, that it is eliminated, and if it is in place, that it's kept to the very minimum. 
Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much. Thanks, Gordon. And the, the figures that Julia was referring to from Intertrade and the Chamber are in, in a slide, and they're um, the All Island Business Monitor for quarter two from Intertrade shows only 9% of businesses in the north have plans in place, um, 17% in the south, and quarter three is still 9% in the north and has gone up to 22% in the south. And for the Chamber of Com Com Commerce, quarterly economic survey for quarter three, only 39% of members were making preparations in quarter one. It was 60%, so that has gone down, and obviously COVID has had a big impact there. So, and thanks for that. Christopher? Thank you, and uh, thank you for your presentation and your uh, answers thus far. I want to seek just some clarity around the legal position. Firstly, I, su I think that there will be uh, a negotiated outcome and it will probably be on the EU's terms if the Prime Minister's conduct up to this point uh, is anything to go on. He can huff and puff, but generally he folds like a cheap suit. Um, but since 1911, uh, the Parliament Act established the principle that the House of Commons has supremacy over the House of Lords. Um, in circumstances where there is a, a non-negotiated outcome, is it a theoretical possibility that the government can revise the internal market bill to cover GB to NI trade and effectively declare the withdrawal agreement dead? Um, well, presumably it's... <laughs> yeah. Sorry? Your connection's Sorry, bad there, I can't really hear you. Either, but, um, Um, sorry, I, I think the legal implications, you would also need to consider the international um, legal implications in terms of whatever um, the process around kind of um, resolving disputes around the withdrawal agreement, which would be separate to the kind of the lack of a future relationship or a free trade agreement. Yeah, although I think um, even uh, Mr. Europe, Julian Maughan himself, accepts that um, Parliamentary sovereignty trumps international. Trump, there's that word. Okay. Trumps um, international law um, in these in these matters. Um, I'm just curious that you know. I, I understand sometimes the outcome of a negotiation is no. One side just says no, and I'm just curious in terms of uh, how we then respond to that and where Northern Ireland's place is in that. So, if the government was, for example in a position where there was a non-negotiated outcome and simply refused to operate uh, EU VAT rules in Northern Ireland, um, what would the implications be beyond um, you know, this, this quite nebulous concept that we would be in breach of international law? Um, I, I suppose we're, 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 we're into complex legal territory way 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 beyond the department for the economy um, <laughs> um to, to 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 be to be fair um and uh, i i'm not sure um uh, if if any of the four of us um are sort of legally trained to anything like that level to offer um you know um, you know, a, a competent response a, 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 to a question of that nature that's fair enough. Um, now I worked in I worked in a press office for five years, so I understand that when there's a prevailing media narrative, um, it's difficult to get messages through. Uh, before COVID, the prevailing the dominant issue in the press was Brexit. Then, for the rest of the year, it has been COVID, punctuated only for a few weeks by the the presidential election in the United States. I'm just wondering, in terms of, as we run towards the end of this period, has there been like a, a budget line established in the department for increased advertising? And I mean, the chair in her opening remarks referred to the radio advertisements and stuff, and I also have noticed that taking place. But if we're um, getting to a situation where um, potentially a no deal outcome um, and therefore, we have to react quickly to that. I'm just wondering, um, has there been a budget line established for communications in that regard? Um, we, we, we may need to go back and, uh, and check that level of detail. Certainly, Invest NI would have uh, um, 
communications budgets. Yes. Um, uh, 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 already, and they, they are often one of our, our, our key um, um, means and channels for um, getting comms to business. Also, there is, uh, in terms of departments, departments would often use the um, um, executive information service that sits within the executive office. Yes. And um, uh, I think we'd probably need to be confirmed, but I, but I would suspect that budgets for executive communications uh, activities would, would probably sit within TEO. Um, but I, I think I, I would need to sort of double check whether that's the case and uh, gauge the extent of those. From, from memory, I think uh, EIS has 48 press officers. So um, we certainly, it's not for the want of manpower that we can't be communicating with people. But no, that's grand. Thank you very much. Just, just in relation to the EIS press officers, as I understand it, um, and again, we may need to double check this, the, the press officers from all the departments are all EIS uh, press officers. So that, that may not just be the, 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 the central team within TEO, that may be the team as spread across all departments. Thank you. Um, thank you all very much for your presentation. Um, obviously, I'm sure we'll be seeing you again probably before the end of the year, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll see some, some progress in terms of the negotiations before then, um, because there's a lot, obviously, for businesses to have to try and prepare for. Um, there's a few things that we'll probably want to follow up on. Yeah, Chair, um, we, we've, I've noted a number of bits of information that we're going to go back on. Um, and also the questions are coming from us with oh, yes. those on. So, um, as I had mentioned in, in the, the kind of introduction to the session, we had a, a session from the EU Affairs Manager yesterday around the common frameworks. Um, so we have some questions, but we'll um, pass those on to you just um, through, through the, the department, through the DALO. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks very much. Thanks. Nice. Thank you. Okay, um, so sorted out. Huh? Per Shane, I mean the camera thing. Oh. Um, I think it's the last person on though, because invariably whenever I was coming on, there could be a bandwidth it's issue. Bandwidth issue. It would oh, need to prioritise the, the yeah. video over the over the audio. Talk to I'll maybe talk to Combs about that chair. Yeah. When we seem to have more than four or five people on, it does. One seem does that's the first out. thing that goes as they drop picture and you just get signed. Yeah. So, Peter, we were going to follow up then and rise to the to CEO around the communication piece. Yes, Chair. Um, as as the discussion sort of revealed, um, there are radio adverts going on pretty much constantly about the, the Twitter support service. I'm sure everybody's heard those kind of when they're in the car and so on. Um, what the other suggestions seem to be coming out of things was potentially, um, we've heard it several times now from different sources, that it, it, it would be best the message communicated by uh, executive ministers. People are more likely to pay attention to that. So almost in the, the sense of the, the COVID media um, campaign where you know ministers were giving very specific, if you do this, you need to do this, much as the, the officials were suggesting, you know, there are adverts ongoing um, and they're, they're, they're adverts that, that cover all regions, um, but that, that's how they're structured. If you, if you do this thing, you therefore now need to consider doing this thing. And they push the trader support service as well. Um, so it, it may be a case of just asking the executive to either do more or at least let us know what they're doing. Members content with that? Mm -hmm. Okay then, um, so we're going to go back to item number three, which is Chair's business. Um, in Members Pack at page 13, there's a clerk's memo on the informal meeting we did last Thursday with the Commission on, gender e on a Gender Equal Economy um, and the Chief Executive of Women's Tech. The Commissioner for, of a Gender Equal Economy, there is a presentation, a slide presentation on creating a caring economy at page 16 of your packs. At page 26, there is creating a caring economy slide presentation with more detailed slides. Um, at page 53, there is the unadjusted gender pay gap um, in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland 2020 report. Um, and 
just to remind members that we agreed to hold the informal meeting with Women's Tech to hear about um, a recent report it had been involved in producing entitled Creating a Caring Economy, a Call to Action. Um, it was a very useful briefing, so it was with a number of issues that we're going to potentially follow up on in terms of micro-inquiry yeah. as well, just around skills and childcare different pieces that came out of the discussion? Chair, sure, we, we've pretty much got the background for the skills um, micro-inquiry set up. Uh, we, we don't want to leave too much distance between the discussion event and the um, debate, so we're, we're probably looking at pushing that into the new year just so that there's a less of a gap between them. But um, there's an incredibly helpful uh, OECD report about skills here that, that was commissioned by the department. Um, that also takes into account COVID. It's incredibly contemporaneous. It's really, really useful. Um, you know, it's not often you get the opportunity to say it's a couple of hundred pages of gold, um, but it is, and it will be what we base the the skills discussion around, because it sets out all the issues that you know, need to be looked at, need to be addressed. And I suppose what's incredibly reassuring is that the department has already gone out and commissioned this. The minister has welcomed it and officials are now looking at how they can address a lot of the issues. So it will allow whatever the committee does to dovetail with the department. So we're preparing that now. What I'm hoping is we get um, questions format and some background to members um, hopefully next week and then we'll plan a date for that, the other thing I probably should just mention while I'm on the subject of the micro inquiries is we have a date for our macroeconomic outlook report debate, and that's Monday, the eighth of December. I'm saying that's a Monday. Yeah, it's a Tuesday. Tuesday, the eighth of December. Uh, we have no indicative time yet, and that's still provisional and requires, I think, confirmation from the business um, committee. But that's kind of what we're looking at. So we'll provide more detail on that for members. Um, we'd agreed a motion on that one. Um, business office have had to add some commas. Um, just from the perspective of a clerk reading it out. Um, and also they, they had to add another and into it. But we, we bring that back to members um, to, to see. It's one of those things business office do have to do. A little bit of editing just to make the thing manageable but they did confirm you're not allowed to use full stops so that they understood why there was uh, quite so many semicolons um but yet yeah, we're, we're we're looking at that and we'd hope to bring in um the um commissioner and some other colleagues for that skills debate and there's there's some useful information that i I resisted the temptation to start putting legislation into the pack as well, but that's something we want to come back to look at. Um, I know legislation here differs from legislation in GB, um, and that's something I think the committee may want to look at um, in conjunction with the department whenever um, a suitable sort of employment um, bill comes along, which one will, you know, before very long. Okay. Um, and I just I suppose also to, to reflect on our, our debate on Monday, which I think was, was well received in terms of the, the energy um, micro inquiry report. I think it was a useful debate. So thanks to the clerk and the, the staff for Chair, all actually, of their efforts in terms of that. Chair, I've actually this morning got a couple of emails from companies who, after hearing the debate, now want to know if we can help them sort out some of those issues so I think we've become a new brokerage for that. We forward those on to the department because it, some of it's quite useful people offering all sorts of um, very useful sort of um, products and so on. Okay, thanks for that. So moving on then to item number five which matters arising at page 176 there's a response from the infrastructure minister in relation to airport connectivity. We had agreed to write to the infrastructure minister on the 4th of November and the minister stated whilst her department is not directly responsible for air connectivity she remains committed to working alongside executive colleagues the finance and economy ministers to maintain air connectivity across these islands and further afield and to consider measures required by the executive to support the aviation sector. So unless members have any additional comments... It's Chair, it might just be worth reminding members, and I know it seems like a, a very long time ago, with the collapse of Fly Bay, mm -hmm. you'll remember that the executive um, was talking to the UK government about support. That's all still happening, and it's still out there, and the Fly Bay routes are still being picked up um, yes. by small regional airlines, so that's all still in progress. 
and it's happening in the background, I suppose now largely in preparation for when the um, air travel begins to expand out again. Chair, yeah, I think I'm out front. It might be useful just to get a brief from our local airports just on the routes that still haven't been covered. Yeah. Certainly noticed recently Belfast City Airport, um, Aer Lingus, or at least one of their subs subsidiaries, has essentially picked up most of the former Fly B routes, but it would be useful just to see what where the gaps are. Yeah. We'll do. No problem. Okay, then moving on to um, 5.2, there's correspondence from the FE Principals Group in relation to the awarding of qualifications and next steps. Um, so, unless members have any additional comments to make on that. Sure. Yeah, John, go ahead. Uh, can I come on just on the ladder from the FE Colleges the Principals? It's an interesting ladder on, on a development of a conversation and debate that we've had. Uh, back and forth with both with both officials and some of the FE college leaders. I note in the last paragraph the, of the letter they're seeking further engagement. Yeah. Would it be possible to set up a meeting with them to continue that engagement and explore this matter further? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that, that was very much um, our, our sort of intention. Um, Mr. O'Dowd's absolutely right. This is a, an issue that we have been um, keeping going in the background as, as we turned our sights more towards COVID and, and EU exit. Um, but the, the idea would be a, a discussion forum just with the um, FE colleges and the training providers that also use um, the likes of BTEX and so on, just to get a more of a feel. So if members are content, we'll go ahead and start organising that. Yeah. Sure, again, again this, this, this falls around it. I've raised a number of questions for the minister around this, and it is an area believe where some time ago essentially FE colleges relied on Northern Ireland examinations and then for a variety of reasons seem to have got bought into UK wide for um, commercial providers <clears throat> um, and I think the argument is that there's a desire perhaps to move back to more locally based examinations and that would appear to make sense for a range of reasons. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, 5.3 then, page 179, is a joint letter from NICVA, WCVA and SEBO to the, the British Chancellor in relation to the Shared Prosperity Fund. Um, we obviously had a briefing from NICVA last week. Um, just ask members to note the issues that are highlighted on page 80. Um, and if members would be agreed that we write to NICVA to seek an update when they receive a response from the Chancellor. That's fine. The announcement on Shared Prosperity Fund is today, isn't it? That's what we're hoping for. That we've got other correspondence chair later on on that too. So I'm hopeful we get some answers. I, I'm, I'm making that an agenda item for next week. We, we get yeah. We, we've we've got more we want to do on that one. Um, so there's That's another as I say further on. Get on. Okay, thank you. Um, then at page three of your table pack, there's a letter of thanks from the president of NUS USI, Alan Farron, in relation to. The work the committee has done in raising issues relevant to students and the steps taken to, to work these issues out. And Peter, did we get any? <laughs> this week has, has proved to be a really very, very difficult week to organise anything, so we are still pinning down um, meeting with the. And I don't think we, we said it previously, but I also think um, Dara Chair, because they have Caffrey, okay. and we, it's, it's, it hadn't really crossed my radar, but I imagine. Although the, the policy lead obviously lies with DERA, there's a student union and so on there that we haven't communicated with before. Um, and if members are content, I might just make contact to see if there's anything we're not getting that we, we should be aware of. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so moving on then, at page four of your table packs, there's correspondence and a report from NILGA in relation to the EU successor funding. Um, the committee obviously has received previous briefings from NILGA, one on the 21st of October, um, about the role of local government in tourism strategies. Um, it's hoped, obviously, there will be the announcement around the Shared Prosperity Fund today, um, which will respond to some of those issues that have been raised by both NILGA, NILGA and NICVA. Um, and, as we said, we'll bring this back to um, committee next week. So moving on, if members are okay, we'll move to item number 10. There is an SL1 um, on the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996, Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Um, 
There is a clerk's memo at page 43 of table papers. There is correspondence from the DALO at page 45 of table papers. The department proposes to make an SR under powers conferred by Article 24 of the Employment Rights NI Order 1996. The purpose of the statutory rule is to continue to provide greater certainty in the calculation of a week's pay and to ensure that furloughed employees do not lose out as regards certain statutory entitlements when, um, which relate to the termination of employment by having been furloughed if their employment is terminated while or shortly after they've been um, furloughed <coughs> under the job retention scheme. The SR will be subject to negative res resolution procedure before the Assembly and this is the committee's opportunity to consider the pol policy set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend the rule um, once it has been laid. So, are members content with that? Indeed, uh, very welcome, Chair. Sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so we are moving back then to item six, which is correspondence. Um, at page 182 of your pack, there is the Minister's correspondence in relation to the Postal Administration Rules, Northern Ireland 2020. Um, so while DFE has lead on insolvency, the focus of this is court proceedings and therefore the Department for Justice will lead on the legislation. The Postal Administration rules will bring the North into line with Britain where rules have been introduced. They set out the procedures for the Postal Administration processes under the Postal Services Act 2011 and are designed to ensure the continuance of the universal postal system service in the event that a company providing that service is at risk of entering insolvency proceedings. So as to note, unless members have any comments. No, sure. It'll come to the Justice Committee, and I know um, they, they may well um, seek a view from the committee on that one. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. Then at page 143, or sorry, 83, um, there is correspondence from Ulster University um, giving us an update on the number of positive COVID-19 cases and their information gathering. So again, it, it's to note, unless no, members have any comments. It's relatively low, isn't it? The number is very low. Mm -hmm. But obviously, uh, people are not attending. Online learning. It's online learning. Yeah. So, <laughs> the, the risk of getting it at the university, I suppose, is very low. So, That's good. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Then, 6.3 at page 184, the 29th report of the examiner of statutory rules. Um, are members content to note? Great. And then at 193 is the 30th report of the examiner's statutory rules. Are members content to note? Great. Yeah. So then at page 17 of our table pack, there's the statement from the Minister of Finance um, in relation to the November COVID funding exercise. The department has received 137.7 million in that allocation, um, which includes a <coughs> company director scheme for, which is at 20 million, a top up to the large tourism, the hospitality, retail, and leisure businesses will get 5 million, a scheme for wet pubs, um, which is 10.6 million, a scheme for B&Bs, which is 4.1, um, a 3 million extension for the digital selling capability grant um, through Invest NI, and a high street voucher scheme, which has been allocated um, 95 million pounds. Um, and I think there's been significant commentary, particularly around the, the high street voucher scheme uh, and how, what it is actually designed to do. Um, and I think it, it would be useful to get um, some further information around that. We are going to seek um, some information from both Jersey and Malta, where similar schemes like this have been rolled out. Um, and apparently both of the governments in those countries have um, indicated that they're repeating their exercises of schemes because they, they um, were successful. Chair, Jersey's was a, a chargeable card, um, much like what's been suggested here. Malta's was um, coloured vouchers um, that were, there was blue ones, there was red ones, and they applied to different businesses. Uh, and you could only use it on local businesses, and it was designed so that you maximised your use in your own local area. With the Jersey one, um, the card can be limited to the sorts of places it can be used. Um, I was hoping to get a bit more from them, but their their government websites are, are structured in a way that you've pretty much got to live in Jersey and have a registration number to get into the bits you want to get into. But from what I understand is that people have this card, they keep the card, it can be charged up centrally. So they're able to use it not just for this, but for a variety of other things as well. So it sounded very clever, but I'm going to try and get all of the sort of official background notes on that. 
Um, but, but Jersey closes down very precisely at five o'clock and you can't get people. Oh, okay. Oh, Chair, um, in relation to all of the schemes which are relevant to this department that, that, that you read out, um, <clears throat> we, we need to keep a very tight eye on what is happening. It would be important that we now get a very detailed report from the department on how they propose to roll out each of the schemes for which they've received funding to continue to identify the gaps and to try and work out how those gaps can be filled. And particularly in relation to the card scheme, um, and it is early days at this stage, but I think from day one, and let me count today as day one, this committee needs to be receiving weekly briefs in respect of how the department intends to progress this. It is fraught with difficulties. It's got certain radio programmes written all over it uh, in terms of scandal. Um, and we need to put a very clear marker down now. I'm not expressing a view one way or another in respect of support, although I do have some private views in respect of it. But I think, Chair, we need as a committee to take this extremely seriously. Um, I appreciate the purpose, which is to deliver £85 million into the economy. Is that the best way to do it? And if it's been determined that that's the way, this is the way it's going to be done, then we need to take a very detailed and forensic examination as to how this is progressing. And that, uh, if you just bear with me for a second, takes me into a second area, and maybe an area where we took our eye off the ball, which is in relation to uh, this issue with regards to rates and wind turbines. Uh, further dreadful news has, has, has fall, fallen out of that today um, in relation to FOI inquiries and the ro role of the economy department um, in respect of that. Uh, and that just, if you like, is a clear demonstration of what happens if you do take the eye off the ball. So I think it's, it's vital and imperative that if, if the department is to proceed with this card scheme, um, there are issues about, indeed, as the clerk has said, how you even procure the card, how much will that cost, all of those things. This committee needs to have a hands-on, day-by-day, if not hour-by-hour, um, scrutiny of. Thanks for that, Stuart. Um, we were, if I was just going to continue, the, we were going to seek a, a briefing from an economist around the actual purpose of the scheme for next week, if members are content mm. with that. Um, yeah. and, um, also, in relation to the schemes, um, we were going to ask members' agreement to seek um, officials to come in and give an oral briefing on the, the schemes overall. Um, there are, are a number, I know members have particular interest around the, the scheme for the newly self-employed, um, yeah. which the 10 million was previously allocated for, and, and for now the, the, the sole company directors um, would be really positive if those schemes could get out to people before Christmas. So, um, yeah, I, I'm just, um, so if members are content with that, um, and just in relation to the issue around the wind turbines, the committee had no... Uh, Chair, I've, I've, uh, I, in a conversation I was having on another issue with the, the audit office, um, they are looking at that, obviously, and um, it's something we just never have sight of. That, that was, I guess, part of the, the automated process. Um, but it is something I know there will be a lot more information on. But, but, Chair, there, there are now substantial FOI uh, answers in the public domain, and they are clearly of interest to this committee because there are detailed conversations between civil servants. It's the position of whether the PAC is going to look at this. So, I, And I, I accept that they're, they're primacy in respect of that, but, but we need to make sure that someone is yeah. dealing with it, and if it's not us, then it needs to be the PAC. I so fortunately PAC share an office with the PAC yeah. clerk, so we, we talk about that um, and see where we are with that. Chair, just to come in. Sorry, no, oh, sorry. Um, there is Christopher and then oh, sorry. Gordon and then... <laughs> no, and that's fine. Thank you. First, so. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, when this statement was delivered in the House, um, I asked, I beg pardon, it was at economy questions, I asked the Minister how much she had asked for from the Department for Finance in terms of this allocation. Now, she's been allocated 137 million for the Department, 
my understand her answer to me was that her ask was considerably more than 300 million i have heard a figure of 390 million of an ask so in a situation where the minister for the economy asked for 390 million now i appreciate everybody gets the arm in when they're trying to but to receive just over a third of that which you asked for is important because in coming weeks there will be members who will be seeking to batter the minister up and down the assembly chamber about we need help for this what are you doing about that etc etc and i think it's important that we find out if the figure that she asked for was three hundred and ninety million pounds, what was that? Firstly, what was the figure? What was asked for? And secondly, what did the minister intend to do with that which was asked for? Um, and the second uh, point, it's it's related to, tangentially related to this. Um, last week, I had raised an issue about trying to establish from the department an estimated number once the relief schemes come to an end the est what they estimate the number of unemployed would be and just if we could we have that in as a request and there, there's modeling ongoing they they do regular modeling yes. on that so um they should be able to extract those figures for us and send us that as a briefing but that request has gone in i think it, it would be useful to know what was asked for what was the intention in terms of what the minister intended to do, because um, I think it is important that we that we're equipped with that information. Yeah, no, I, I agree with um, Christopher on that point. I think it would be useful if we could get a breakdown of that in relation to similar to what we get from Monitor and mm -hmm. um, there was a prioritisation of the budget that was made by the minister yeah. and department. Um, and just, I suppose, it, it would maybe be useful to mention that we had hoped to get the minister in um, to discuss these issues. Um, Peter, do you want to give us an update in relation yeah, to Chair, that? Chair, we, we have the Minister scheduled for the 16th. Uh, we did ask for the Minister. Um, the response was that the Minister wouldn't be available um, and would be more in a position on the 16th to be able to talk at length uh, mm -hmm. about the fallout from all the schemes, how the schemes will work and so on. We've already agreed to bring up officials next week and get the Economist in about the voucher scheme. So it will be a case, I suppose, of from that information where members want to go. Um, I think it's useful to get the technical side. Members will recall we, we got a really very good briefing on bids. Previously it was September. Uh, the document was very clear, was very useful. If we could get something the same as that, that would be really, really good. Um, and get the officials that can talk through it as well. Because um, it's so much better to get those questions answered yes. at the time. So if members are content, that's kind of how we'd approach that. Um, and then we can we can sort of look again if we want to bring the minister in again before the 16th. Um, I think to be fair, if you're, if you're putting schemes like this together in a matter of days, I think if she comes in on the 16th, you know, at least it'll have been rolled out for two and a half weeks. So I think that's fair enough. That's fair. I think, if, Chair, if we have the officials next week to at least give parameters rationale and so on, um, and, and the process, because I think that's going to be one of the key things is, is the process of getting the money out the door. But also, it would be um, wrong of me to not also flag up the, the balance of that being um, the, the faster a scheme is organised, the faster you put a system in place. If it's not an already an established system, and even if it is, there's always the potential for error um, and an ineligible payment. So I just want to just put that on the table um speed will incur error yes and we just need to be very clear that we you know we're, we're aware of that and we'll we'll work with that um but we we'll proceed and try and get that organized for next week the the bids paper there should be a bids paper there yeah. um and there was no issue having it before so i'm yeah. i'm going to go into that with an optimistic view yeah, and obviously there is significant public interest in these issues and, and so the Minister should address them as, as well. Um, Peter, just in relation to the schemes that are ongoing, yes. did we get an urgent um, response in terms to what has been paid out so far um, in relation to particularly Part A 
but how is yeah. Part B going? Yeah. Um, and a time frame for when it is expected that the newly self-employed will come on study because that one has been promised. Yeah, for a few weeks now. Yeah. Right, are members happy enough with that? Yeah. Sorry, Gordon, you were Gordon, yeah, no, just yeah, similar points, Chair. I suppose I'll rattle through a couple of specifics. So on, but on the wind energy, I think you know this has gone on for so many years within this committee, and we do wonder about the capability and the um, ability to deliver on, on such schemes. Things need looked at and reviewed, but we want transparency and we want accountability on these issues and any loopholes that exist and have been identified in schemes need to be closed out. We, we want to stop recurrence and that's there are hard lessons have been learned about mistakes that have been made and everyone makes mistakes especially when they're under pressure but when you make a mistake you've got to take action to stop it and to, to ensure that it, it does not re recur and that's what we want to see in relation to that and we are all outraged at there's overpayments, overpayments that are made on, in relation to wind energy and so on. It's, it is not acceptable and must be addressed. The other schemes, I think we all welcome the, the report this week. I think it is positive. And I, in, a, in the tide of, <coughs> of um, abuse that we get and it comes our way, I think it's very welcome, to be fair, and, and the support is there, and it's important that we get it out. Just a number of points. Um, the localised restriction support scheme for the, the close contact people, such as hairdressers, well, I would like clarification on uh, will those people have to reapply again for the next, for this week and the following two weeks? Now, my understanding yeah. is that they, they will not have to, uh, that but yeah. that the those that, that are open this week will continue to get support yep. right through. So I think that's important we get that finalised. The rumours are out there that that is the case. I haven't been able to establish it in, in any form of writing, so I'd like to see that clarified and we can get that message out. And there are a number of other points. Hotel sector need further support. And I've had contact today from the hoteler in North Down. The impact of the, the three household rule is already knocking their business back over Christmas because people will now be able to sit safely at, ho at home or well, safely in brackets at, in homes and they're now withdrawing their bookings from local hotels because of that. So there's a major impact there and I understand there's a scheme being drafted up for the hotel's support so we need to keep the pressure on on that. Just a couple of other things. Um, yeah, The um, golf courses I know it's, you might think it's all um, a bit of fun, but there's a major concern out there why golf courses are closed. And I understand from messages we got today, they're in the meeting, that organised fishing is now being permitted. Now, if organised fishing is permitted, I don't see a lot of difference in proper managed golf courses where members go in. And golf clubs have set up uh, COVID um, management systems and have worked well. And they're relatively safe places to go. And by the way, I don't play golf. I haven't time. But uh, the, at the end of the day, I think it's something needs to be looked at and looked at urgently. It's a very healthy uh, occupation for those that have time to do it. And I think we should be doing our best to support it. Uh, a couple of other things, just um, estate agents. We have a number of estate agents on to us who would certainly like to continue business in the next two weeks. And business in some areas is good against all the odds and uh, you know again in a COVID compliant uh, system I think they should be seriously considered. So I'd appreciate those points being added in. The taxis, finally just the taxis, I think we're all concerned that that is dragged on and dragged on for far too long and needs to be addressed. And I know we have made efforts here as a committee, we've lobbied strongly and hard on it but uh, I find it most disappointing that we haven't seen movement on the taxi situation. Thanks, Chair, for your tolerance. Um, thank you, Gordon. Um, Peter, perhaps we could write about the uh, golf course. Yeah, because it, it, I suppose it is the ultimate non-contact sport, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's really no contact on your outside. So I'm not on, I don't totally understand that one, but we'll, we'll put that through to... to Good to man, the thank you. Sorry, Chair. 
Oh, 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 are we seeking clarity on that point in, in relation to golf courses, or what exactly are we seeking? Clarity, whether or not they can, and, and, and what what the reasoning is on that. Yeah. Um, okay. Because if flight, sorry, was it you, Mr. Dunn? What was the sort of fishing that you talked about? What's that, sir? You said you'd indicated there was fisher particular type of fishing. Was yes, it? yeah, sports fishing or sports you know, fishing, organized sports. fishing. It's has just it's the clarity of comparability. Yeah, I guess they've got that now for you know fishing clubs. That go to lakes and reservoirs yeah. and so on. That has now been approved by DERA. Okay. Thanks for that, Gordon. And yeah. I suppose just on your point about the support, the click and collect as well, that has now been announced. Yes. yes. That for non essential retail, they will still be able to get the financial support even if they do the yes. click and collect. So that has been Good. confirmed as well. Chair, so, sorry. On, sorry, there's John Stewart. Yeah, everyone and wants in. Yourself. <laughs> be patient. <laughs> um, thanks, Chair. Um, just to follow up on a couple of Gordon's points, I've got a number here. Um, my understanding, Gordon, and hopefully the, uh, we'll get clear on this, is that stage agents have, can continue to, to be open. I think. And that as long as they yeah. work, work within the current parameters, they're allowed to. Um, so that is good news. Yeah. That's certainly the advice that I've been passing on to the agents in my yeah. constituency who've been contacting yeah. me. Um, with the golf courses, I totally agree because in the winter time as well, it's there's probably a, a fifth of actual people playing compared to the summertime mm -hmm. and we're able to continue the summertime so with the winter season is actually a lot more limited in terms of the numbers That's taking place and it is it, it is as um as open as you can get in, the, in those spaces um and i had the clarity this week it's the only bit of clarity i've had up to say from lps and invest and i is that those will automatically be paid to those who are entitled to the grant who've already applied the problem is chair that we're still I'm sure we're all the same, getting inundated with constituents who own businesses that applied over five weeks ago for either the LRSS scheme or the Invest in I scheme from the Department of Economy, who cannot get their money, who cannot get any updates, and then after they do get an email to five weeks, it says something like, please provide an accountant's letter. And these are um, ladies or young men who, who rent chairs and salons who don't have accountants. Mm -hmm. They are people who have never needed accountants. They are driving instructors who have all the credentials you could possibly need through the Department of Infrastructure to validate their credibility and are still being asked for accountants' letters. What on earth do these people have to do to get their money? It is despicable. We're now in the mouth of Christmas. It's a cliche to say it, but we quite frankly are. And they have no faith. And when they hear these announcements, which are great, and I, the prepaid card, I think, will be... What could well be an, a fantastic scheme to stimulate the economy, economy, but given that January, when we're talking about rolling out, six weeks away from now, it's taken five weeks for people to get an email to say that their application is being processed. I mean, um, on the directors thing, it's great, long overdue, but again, I agree with you. Get get by Christmas. There's a ready-made portal. The the hardship grant portal is there, but again, we're four weeks from Christmas. Yep. So I just. We need to do all we can. I want to say, I mean, people, whatever has to be done, around the clock working the processes. I mean, another girl just emailed me while we're in this meeting to say she just received an email five weeks after applying for the scheme to say she needs an accountant's letter. Five weeks. She says she doesn't have an accountant. She's nearly in tears. I mean, this is just cannot go on. And there is no place to get any answers. I have taken it. I've probably all done it. Ian Snowden has been fantastic. Mm. But it shouldn't be down to the chief executive of LPS to go back to each individual MLA to get an update. There's no helpline. Help There's no one to go to. And they're just crying out for help. And I just fear that a lot of these are going to be delayed or overlooked. Um, again, someone's contacted me here this morning to say he's... A, he's, a, um, he's being told he can't get the grant because they're using Google and other search engines to verify whether his business exists rather than using the information he's provided. You know, we're, there's no appeal mechanism. There's no one to speak to. We just need to get all this through. And if, we get, if we're given someone to talk to, we could get these answers to people. But I really feel for them because it's just not acceptable. Yeah, no, thanks for that, John. Um, in relation to the accountant's letter, I've raised this with Invest NA and was told they don't need an accountant's letter. It's not a, a requirement um, sure that's for say. people who wish to use it. That's not yeah. what the email says. That I've raised that with, mm. with the minister as well. Well, to come right. back on that, Chair, the chair of the Driving Instructors Council contacted me yesterday to say the only people, only driving instructors in the country who paid so far their grant are the ones that provide accountants letters. So it is being prioritised. And, and the minister said in the chamber on Tuesday all those who provide accountants mm. Um, letters have been paid, so uh, I, I suppose that is um, as, as a concern. So can we read sure, that? We, we have had a written response from the department indicating um, the accountant's letter wasn't necessary. That's so that, that's a concern if that's mm -hmm. coming back. Clearly, been prioritised as well. Um, 
that's it's not needed. In the, process, no. the, the verification credentials provided by the Department of Infrastructure for a driving instructor are as secure and legally binding as you require. So, I, these I, are all businesses that are either they're on somebody's system, hmm? they're licensed or they're you know registered. They're, there's taxes, there's you know company names that have been registered and so on. But just to um, highlight the point again. Uh, driving instructors, beauty salons and hospitality represent a small percentage of the total number of businesses that are now being forced to close down this lockdown. If we can't get answers now and these people can't get paid in five weeks, what on earth sort of SH1T storm are we going to face whenever everyone's applying for these grants? It doesn't bear thinking about. I have six more emails this morning from local businesses. Some with reference numbers, Chair, but still no money. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you see the issue particularly about the, the contact point? It's one we've raised previously. And, and have um, raised again, Chair, because um, it came out of last week's meeting too, and we have been told go through private office. Yeah, that's very, very no, slow. Um, and we understand that there is a, a high volume of um, communication going through, but people are very, very frustrated at this point. So we need a, a we contact. make that point again. And as um, John has said, Ian Snowden from LPS has been fantastic, but it's, it's a similar situation if you're, you're here and you're trying to get information from, from investors or others. So, so we need to have a, a direct contact point if that's possible at all. And one final point, I don't want to have to play a negative role in this or a, like a critical role. I think we all want to play a constructive role, which is why we look forward to seeing the department officials in next week to feed into this, because it's better to highlight what could go wrong and how these schemes could work better than come back in six or eight weeks' time and say, why yeah. wasn't this done? So I think we're all wanting to play that constructive role and help wherever we can, but we need to have the, the ability to communicate, and we just don't. Okay, thanks for that. Sinead, can we... Yeah, you're in the spotlight. Hi, um, well, John Stewart actually has raised um, the issues that I wanted to raise. It was about the delays and actually getting getting the monies out. Uh, and uh, as I say, Derry's two weeks ahead. So we're, some of our businesses are now seven weeks without money. And as I raised before, you know, some of these are family businesses. So two or three members of the one family um, are left without support. Uh, uh, it has been extremely difficult. People that have never found themselves in debt before or never without uh, income um, are, are really, really struggling uh, to the point of, of, of considering closing down their premises. So it, it is really important, but I do feel that it must be a manpower issue. There has to be a resource issue here of an inability to deal with it. And, and as John says, this is only going to get worse in the next couple of weeks because there's going to be more applications coming in uh, as a result of more businesses being closed down. So I think we need to urgently find out what the problem is. Um, I, I, you know, is there not enough people working on this particular, uh, these particular schemes? Uh, because there appears to be absolutely a complete blockage somewhere along the line. And then the other thing that I would just like to say, it's about the, the voucher scheme. Um, I, I don't know enough about it, but and, and my jur the jury's out about how effective it's going to be, and we'll wait until the economist comes in and gives us an idea next week. But there's been a lot of mixed messaging around it. Uh, the minister on Monday indicated that it was going to be a payment per household, of, uh, in the region of £200, and then um, yesterday we, we, we learned through the media it could be a £50 voucher per person. I don't know. I don't know if it's the most effective use of money. I, I just really get very uncomfortable when I hear of, of many businesses um, that haven't received a penny, and yet we're, we're, we're doing um, some of, you know, implementing another scheme um, that, that seems to be extremely generous sure. but we need to make sure that there's a lot of transparency and governance around it i would like to think that this is to help local independent businesses in our high street uh, and it's not a general voucher that you can use everywhere uh, a lot of our major um, international stores etc etc also sell online uh, and haven't been as hard hit as, as our high street stores that have, have closed down or, or have been um, closed down during the lockdowns, the two lockdowns. 
Uh, and I, I also really need to, we all need to know what is the schemes. I have not a clue what those, that wet pump scheme is for the 10.6. So greater clarity is required. Uh, and I think us in the economy committee were expected to have some kind of insight into this. Uh, and we really don't. We were as much a see uh, as, uh, as other members of the public, which probably isn't uh, very uh, reassuring to, to the general uh, business community or the, the general public. Um, Gary is in first and then yourself, Christopher. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I suppose I echo a lot of the comments that have already been made. Um, I, I do share the concerns of my colleague uh, Christopher Stafford in relation to uh, the bids that were made. I appreciate that there's a limited pot of money. Uh, at the same time, you know, the, the 300, over 300 million, which was requested, uh, would have done a lot more in terms of, of trying to obviously get us out of this uh, situation, but also to look to recovery fees. And, uh, you know, the, the voucher scheme, the people that I've been speaking to in the business community uh, see that as a walk move because January and February uh, will be a more difficult period. Uh, we know that people will spend money as they come to Christmas if the shops are allowed to open. Uh, prior to that, uh, January and February will, we will be in a different situation. But I think, uh, like other members, we, we need to see the detail on that. I think it was unhelpful, uh, some of the commentary. I know that the Finance Minister did give a figure of 200 uh, pounds per household that didn't come from uh, the Department for the Economy, but, but I'm saying that, that's not to say that that wasn't the information that he had at the time based on the higher level of support that would have been required as opposed to the 95 million that the Department for the Economy did receive. But another point that I want to make is around the confusion that some members seem to have around these schemes that are available to businesses. Um, the, the, the local age restriction scheme um, which has been pointed out and which has been in play in my constituency for quite some time. Uh, there has been a huge level of disappointment in terms of the payments made out to that scheme. Uh, the Finance Minister yesterday in the Chamber indicated that you know, less than 50% of payments have been made. You know, that's deeply worrying and as Sinead has said in terms of uh, our constituency, you know, we've been uh, dealing with this for two additional weeks uh, beyond the rest of the world. So the impact here is no doubt greater than elsewhere in Northern Ireland. It's just I wanted to put, put that point, and that's not a criticism. Uh, it, it seems to be right across the board that, that people don't know where to go in terms of questioning particular schemes. Like I have people on to me this morning in relation to Part A and Part B of the uh, schemes put forward by the Economy Department. Other people are coming on around the premises. Uh, and, and it is important to say, and I have to thank uh, you know, Sue, Sue Gray in particular in terms of the finance department, in fairness to her, uh, she has been very proactive, but as others have said, you know, maybe we need to look at capacity and resource within departments to get these schemes out much more quickly, but efficiently and effectively to the people that need it as well. So uh, it's an ongoing point, but hopefully we can take it up with officials uh, when they come forward to the committee as soon as possible. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to make two points. Firstly, I agree with uh, what has been said in relation to the need for the scheme to be properly constructed and scrutinised. Now, one of the ways in which I think it is important that it's properly constructed, I would personally, in the context of what we now know about the effects that COVID is having in terms of domestic abuse mm -hmm. and control, a single household payment is something that I would be uncomfortable yeah, with. Okay. Um, so I think that's something that should be factored in. Um, and then, <clears throat> more generally, <clears throat> I think the people of this country are losing hope because it's, it's really depressing, and to be honest, that every time the latest set of restrictions to the economy and economic activity is announced, the day after they're announced, we have senior officials from the Department of Health doing the rounds in the media saying this might be enough, or this might not be enough, and when this period of time's up, we're going to need more. And it's just knocking the soul out of people. So while we're saying to people we need to undertake this course of action for a fortnight, I find it really dispiriting that you know a couple of days after that's announced. You have people from the Department of Health doing the rounds saying, you need to do this, but in all probability it's not going to be enough and we're going to be back looking more out of you. And I just think that's soul destroying for people. If we're going to encourage people to go down the road of closing down economic activity, 
enduring loss of income, enduring um, all of the restrictions that we're placing on their lives, they need to have a sense of hope that there's an end in sight. And I think that's the job of the economy department, certainly. <laughs> One of our jobs is to say, look, this is hard, but if we undertake this course of action. But it's really, really sad when you, you know, where we end up in that situation where we're effectively telling people, you have to undertake this course of action, but in all probability we're going to be coming back looking at another chunk out of you. Thanks, Christopher. Um, John O'Dowd? Yeah, I think people do need hope. Um, and I think the best hope we have at this stage is that the vaccination process clears all its uh, regulation and, and, and are approved, and, and that's rolled out. But one of the things I think, and, and businesses, businesses who have had to close have been saying to me, is when they look at the large supermarket chains, uh, many of whom are going to probably register an increased profit mm -hmm. uh, for this year, that they're not taking any action in relation to the encouragement of or the enforcement of social distancing, the wearing of face masks, the provision of hand sanitizers, etc. And I think there is a moral obligation, if nothing else, on the large supermarket chains to set the lead in this because they have been allowed to open. The customers have been going to them because other smaller shops uh, and businesses have been closed uh, where they could be playing the part. Now, I do note, and I have seen it myself, where some shops are now providing COVID safety marshals, uh, and you can see them blazoned on their T-shirts, and they're standing at the door of the shops, and they're engaging with customers, and they're talking to customers. Now, I don't expect small retailers to be able to do that because they don't have the financial whereabouts to do it. But I do expect large supermarket chains and large retailers be able to do it and play their part because they have been able to open, they have been able to continue to make money while other businesses have been closed. And if they played their part, uh, it would actually reduce the spread of the virus uh, and allow that space we need to give to our health service. And then it goes back to Christopher's point where businesses can have that opportunity to open up again uh, in a way. But I think we're, we're, we're in a position now where the best hope we have is the vaccination in the early in the new year and there's other committees in the assembly are going to have a, a good hard task on their hands to ensure that vaccination is rolled out thanks for that john um and thanks for, for the, the discussion i think it, it is really important that um we air the concerns and frustrations of businesses that are contacting us um, and we continue to do our best as a committee to ensure that um, that payment gets out as quickly as possible and we continue to endeavour to put all pressure on it. Right the BBC is reporting live on us and we, we have articles on their website with direct and, and contemporaneous quoting. There's just one wee point on the hotels. Um, a lot of those hotels, because of the rate of a value, got no support on their rates initially, so they've had little or no support right through. So I think it's important that that scheme for supportive hotels is, is pushed forward and endorse what has been said in relation to it. Did, did the Finance Minister comment on that? that? That was in his speech the other day in relation to it being for businesses over the 51k that, um, that missed out previously, yeah, the that, larger that business was... one? So that hopefully support should be available. Okay. But I'm, I, we all, I suppose, are looking forward to hearing what the officials have to say next week, and it would be good if they had some detail under each of those headings to, to give to us. I'm, I'm very much hoping those officials will be coming next week. I will certainly be doing my best to ensure that. I, I notice, sorry, the, the B and Bs are covered extensively, but the hotels are not. In, you know, in this programme, so I think we've made it clear we're we're keeping the pressure on. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, chair, just very briefly to comment, and I appreciate he's, he's left the committee now, uh, but in relation to what Christopher Stalford was saying, uh, and I appreciate that this committee's prime responsibility is to do the very best that we can for our, our economy and for those businesses that are players in that economy, but the reality is that honesty is what is required here, and if there's a hard health message to be sold, it needs to be out there. Of that, there must be no doubt whatsoever. Uh, there's a balance to be struck, I accept that, but if people are not accepting health messages or trying to water them down, then it's little wonder that officials are trying to mop up afterwards. Thanks, Gordon. Um, okay, so 
We'll move on then to our next item, um, which is 6.6, 6. 6. Yep. Um, tw page 26 of table pack. This correspondence from um, an individual about the controlling of the price of LPG. Yep, Chair, this, this is a, a correspondent <coughs> we've had previously, and, and we, we did do the research, and, and there, there is no control. Obviously, it's outside the committee's remit to, to launch any investigation into um, price and so on. Uh, the department doesn't control it, and as, as the email indicates, um, it's it's largely controlled by the suppliers because it's a, a market-driven pricing. Mm -hmm. um, we did roll it into the the issue around costs of alternative fuels and fuel poverty in the debate. Um, and when I've corresponded with with the the individual, that that's kind of where we were, and he was very grateful um, for that as well. Um, it's where else we, we, we can go with this. Um, it is a market. Um, I don't want to say market failure, but when you've got a small market and only a few competitors, it makes it a lot easier to pump the prices up. Um, it's not a huge market. Now, if it was a bigger market, then you bring in more competition, you then attract the attention of the regulator. It's, it's just it's not a big enough market for regulation either. I was just about to ask, what is the role of the... Regulator doesn't have a role here. They have a role in relation to electricity, natural gas, and water sewage, as, as the, the correspondent has indicated. Those are, in relative terms, fairly regulated um, markets, largely because of the, the, the infrastructure they represent and the size. Yeah. This, because it's not attached necessarily to a network, and it's direct sort of sale, it means there isn't that level, there hasn't been that level of control, but it's where you go around that. Is not, Chair, a, a competition of markets uh, inquiry, potentially? I mean, I appreciate that it is a small market in Northern Ireland, but, you know, there are substantial differences in price between here and the rest of the UK, um, and Northern Ireland is not dissimilar to, in many parts to rural Scotland and rural Wales, where people, mm. if they want gas, the only choice is LPG. Um, there are only probably two main suppliers in Northern Ireland, and I doubt there are many more in rural parts of Scotland or Wales. I would have thought this is, I don't know what the Competition Markets Authority, whether they have micro inquiries or whether they, they cover small niche areas, but could we at the very yeah, least right. inquire? Right. What about the Consumer Council here? And the Consumer, well, the Consumer Council has has <coughs> late response or late complaints. Um, you might recall we had their um, um, annual accounts in last week, and they they cleared the number of complaints they get around LPG, but they have no power to act on on that. It's it's no. a case of feeling the complaints, seeing what mechanisms there are, when the mechanisms aren't there. So I think probably that's the only place left, sort of, for us to go is to write. To the competitions and market authority and ask just exactly how this works and can they look at this because you are to no fault of local people that they're not able to get that you know level of competition the prices here are so much higher you know you're talking almost double the price so if we go ahead and do that chair sure, what about key can we get the department to look at um broadening the responsibility of the utility regulator to to include it that's that chair is the other thing um usually that's a uh, there's a like i suppose a trigger point of usage um the number of people involved in that mm -hmm. i think it will naturally come as we we see the alternative fuels mm -hmm. and and we look at um you know ways of supplementing the renewables we have mm -hmm. um in terms of you know we we'd be putting um probably hydrogen through our gas system instead of the, the gas we have, mm. the natural gas we have. So that's where this will come more into play. But just at the minute, it's still a very small market. But it's something um, we've raised as an issue for the energy strategy. Um, and it's something you would um, you know, anticipate that the department will have to address as part of their alternatives and their strategy um, applying to more um, isolated markets rural areas and so on where you, you don't necessarily already have a developed infrastructure. So it's it's an issue that's live still. But if we write initially um, the Competition and Markets Authority asking what sort of mm -hmm. role they have here, because there surely must be something more. Mm. And then we'll take it from there. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thank you. 
Okay, so 6.7 then at page 27 of your table pack with correspondence from an individual um, about universities and the spread of COVID-19. Um, Peter, I'll let you take this one. Yeah, Chair, um, members, I think, have, have in many cases got direct correspondence mm -hmm. um, from, from this individual. So we, we obviously have a lot of information and activity from them. Um, we're in a difficult position where um, we don't have a remit to tell the universities how to manage students in private rented accommodation. It falls more into the remit of other departments and other committees. I know um, certainly last night in the news there was a big focus on the activity in the Holy Lands. Um, you know, members were on as well. There was talk of increasing PSNI patrols and so on. This is it's something we, we're in a very difficult position to do anything about, largely other than saying, look, this, this is not right, needs to be condemned. In terms of the, the university's independence, but beyond that, the fact that students have been given the facility to go home, there is testing, there um, will probably be priority vaccination for students as well. Um, it, it, it doesn't leave us a lot of room to manoeuvre. Um, other than condemnation that this is going on in Holy Lands, particularly that there's no social distancing, that none of the precautions, none of the restrictions are taking place, and students whose courses are now online do not need to be there. Um, in relation to the specific ask about... We, we, can't, we can't launch a public inquiry. Um, we, we don't have that facility, and it's, it's out with our remit. That's an executive or ministerial decision. And I know um, the department has had all of these um, queries and responses. And, and there's a, a lot of contact with the universities too around FOIs. So um, if members are content, Chair, we, we write back to the correspondent and indicate that we don't have um, the ability to intervene and call a public inquiry as they want us to because it's beyond our remit. Um, but there, there obviously is an issue there, but it's, it's simply beyond what we can do. Jeremy, I also need to bear in mind that the department and the minister encouraged the universities at, the, at that point in time to bring students back because the universities gave an assurance that they would be providing a safe environment. Um, there is a relationship between the department and the universities, one encouraging the other, one uh, and obviously the department was not prepared to pay additional funding to the universities to obviate some of the problems of bringing students back to the Holy Land. Don't wholly blame the universities because at the time, I suppose they believed they had reasonable COVID safe plans in place. The wheels fairly quickly fell off those COVID safe plans. That's the reality of where we're at. Um, but I wish you'd look in encouraging the minister to do any sort of inquiry into something which she encouraged to happen in the first place. Um, John O'Dowd. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair. Um, clearly, uh, disturbing scenes in around the Holy Lands uh, a number of nights. But it's also worth noting that it's not all students, um, that people travel to the area because uh, for a variety of reasons. And many of the students who normally reside in the Holy Lands are actually studying from home. Uh, so while clearly there is students involved, there's also other walks of life involved as well. So I'm always a bit concerned when uh, students, the tide is put on an event because it is students. And in fairness, there's also a wide range of age groups of students, yeah. uh, some of whom whose partying days are long behind them. <laughs> so <laughs> we can't just use that brand in terms of students. But we did, uh, I'm wondering, is there any word back from the department we We'd raised the issues last week following a town hall event organised by the Students' Union where there were some harrowing stories of the experience of students over this last period of time. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any response back from the department to the issues we'd raised uh, last week. Not as yet. We're hoping once we get the chairs together we'll be able to do more of a collective, um, take, the collective take the issue up collectively with the executive. Um, I think that's, Chair, probably the other thing I, I would say is that this is going to need to be um, cross 
departmental. You know, it's, it's going to be the whole executive making a decision as to how they want to approach this. As Mr O'Dowd has said, this isn't just students. It, you know, when you get this kind of disorder on the streets and when it is breaking all sorts of regulations and so on, it, it kind of goes into the, the hands of the police and the sort of the, the authorities there. Um, you know, and we know that people have been cautioned and we know that um, you know, there probably will be court action pending there as well. So it is going to be that collective approach and it now occurs to me we need to involve, no we don't really say the Justice Chair. Did we say the Justice Chair? I don't think we did. That we probably need to do that as well. Um, I, I guess, Peter, I suppose it is important to, to also say the enforcement side of it and that, that part of the issue in relation to students is, is one aspect to it. There are, are many other aspects to it that we have discussed at length in terms of the providing the guidance and the, the support and, so and all of those things that really there does need to be a focus on. And, and um, Stuart is quite right that the, the economy minister has a particular remit in respect of that. And our ongoing call has been that she should take the lead in, in respect of those issues. Um, in terms of a coordinating role? Sure, because we, we have written to her to say that and to the executive, um, the, the First Minister, um, and we've also written to the Health Minister on this as well. Um, it, it is just getting that coordination. Um, and, you know, actually tackling that, that situation as it as it continues to develop. It's, it's one of those things that, you know, it, it's kind of hard to pin down now why particularly it's it's happening um, and it's almost one of those sort of the more attention it gets the worse it seems to get um, but we, we are just to, to answer Mr O'Dowd's question we are um, still seeking that response and uh, as I say once we can get a, a time slot to organise meeting of all the chairs that's just been difficult um, this week's just been with our debate and the health chairs debate and so on um, I think that concerted across the board action um, will carry significant weight. Okay, thank you for that. Can I just come in, Chair, please? Go ahead, Sinead. Okay, no, I mean, I obviously uh, I, I regret the, the behaviour in the Holy Lands in the past few nights and I hope um, that it stops pretty quickly. Um, as it will have an impact on people's health because if, if students are involved and it's not all, all students um, uh, as Joan has said but these students more than likely are going home now in the next few days uh, and that will have an impact on their families as well but also just I, I'm really concerned about the welfare of students and um, you know they've been sold a pup uh, and their, their university experience is way below par in what they were told it would be uh, back in August and September. So we have to be mindful of that as well. And I think just uh, we need to keep on pushing um, the, the, the head so that it, it, this is an all government and all department uh, reaction to find solutions as well. But certainly um, our, the Minister of the Economy should take the responsibility it is in her portfolio um, for higher education and we need to make sure that you know going forward that the second semester's come along pretty pretty quickly we don't want to repeat um, on the first semester it will do more damage untold damage actually uh, to, to the outcomes of those young people Chair, just to remind we're, we're taking a meeting with the universities on this as well um, to talk about what sort of action they're taking. Yeah. Um, okay. Chair, I suppose maybe it's worth saying that um, if young people don't develop symptoms themselves, there's a tendency to believe that they aren't carrying mm -hmm. COVID, but they are taking it home. Uh, and members will all have heard the, the adverts, you know, don't be giving it to your, your, your father and your mother and your granny. Mm -hmm. But I think that's part of the issue is those who aren't symptomatic don't think that they're ill or don't think that they can be carrying the illness, which we, we're now aware is patently untrue. Okay, then, um, so moving on to 6.8, at page 37 of the cable pack, there's correspondence from an individual um, about being excluded from um, the exclusion of director, directors from government support. Um, obviously, as we now know, the executive has agreed the £20 million measure to help directors who were previously excluded. 
So um, if members are agreed, we will respond to the individual and see if this team announced what will help them. Probably this is the same one. I received the same correspondence mm -hmm. that other members have just within this week. Yeah. I think it might have been copied right as well. Yeah, it probably is the same one, but yeah. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, item number seven then on your agenda is the forward board program, which is at page 39 of your table papers. Are our members um, content with that? In mind that we have already added some. Uh, yeah. it, it's it's it'll it'll change and evolve, Chair. We'll bring it back to you next week. Okay. Um, and just uh, then, um, I have one item of any other business. It's just in relation to the apprenticeship recovery um, strategy. Obviously, there was a significant amount of money yeah. put towards um, retaining and recruiting apprentices for this academic year and, and subsequently. Um, and we have not then seen you know, the, the additional restrictions that would be useful if we get an update um, as to the uptake of the retention and recruitment um, schemes um, and if there are any implications in relation to money having to be spent by the end of the year in respect of that. Members can comment on that. Great. Yeah. Can I raise an, another point under any other business, Chair? Go ahead, Sinead. Okay. Um, it, it was really a, in uh, relation to a point that Gordon raised earlier about the taxis, and I totally agree with him. Um, it's important that they get support. Now, there is a support programme, and monies are going to come out from the Department of Infrastructure on Monday. However, that is just for operating costs um, that they have incurred additional costs. It is not support for loss of business or anything else. Now, what, what I want to understand is why is that one particular sector not getting any support for, for um, loss of business? You know, it, it is literally the only sector that has been excluded in terms of in its totality. You know, if we're supporting pubs, we're supporting web pubs, etc., etc., why are we not supporting the taxi industry? Uh, as well. So I think we should write a letter to the, the Minister uh, and ask because it's a completely different scheme that has been run out by the Department of Infrastructure. It is just about overheads, nothing else. And, and in relation to that, are they eligible for the Part B yeah. of the um, CRBSS? You would, have, you would have assumed that they, they would fall into that supply chain, supply chain okay. hospitality, tourism, etc. etc. Yeah. Okay, members happy enough with that? Great. Moving on then, um, our next item is the date, time and place of our next meeting, which is um, next Wednesday, the 2nd of December, in this room um, at 10am. So, this is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.